Good morning. Today is January 25th, 2014, and we have uh, one of my good friends and uh, kind of been a regular now with the NPA for a few years, Jeff Cook, going to be talking about um, Riemann statistics as it relates to uh, well, the vacuum fluctuation. And so what does that mean? Uh, he's going to be talking about magnets and uh, He's going to be doing the thing that I love best, which is combining mathematics with, with physics. And uh, I said this earlier, but I'll go ahead and say it again. Um, a lot of people that are not in the NPA, and even some that are in the NPA, you know, want to have the answers to physics, but they don't want to do the math. And I, uh, the analogy, best analogy I can come up with is that's like uh, wanting to have a baby without sex. I mean, you know, you're missing the best part <laughs> if, you <don't, laughs> if you don't do that. So anyway, uh, we, we love math. Jeff loves math, and he also loves getting out there. And he's got a great combination of talents because he can also <coughs> get out there and build stuff and make things happen, and I love that. So you'll be, we'll be seeing a few of his, uh, his experiments. And, in fact, uh, John Warfield, who's been um, – Supporting uh, Jeff's work is physically with Jeff right now. They're meeting, and so that's really cool that he's uh, there. And John needs to get active with us on Saturday mornings. He says he, he doesn't like the math. But anyway, uh, so that's, that's going to be great. I don't want to um, spill any, any of Jeff's time other than I will just say quickly that uh, things are progressing with our whole situation with Dave DeHilster and the current board, Barry Springer and, and, um, and uh, Jim Newburn. Right now, we're getting some help from uh, Nick Percival and Lou LaFollette uh, and looking to get an, opi an official opinion, if you will, from the previous board, which consists of Cynthia Whitney and Don Burdell, um, <clears throat> which would be, a, a, I think, have some weight and uh, basically making an official statement and trying to do this in a way that would be uh, to everyone's best interest and acknowledging uh, Barry and Jim's uh, good, good intentions and goodwill toward the NPA. Just want to be clear that it's it's never been questioned by anyone that everyone uh, involved has always had the NPA's interest at heart. So it isn't as though and there's greedy people here who are trying to you know who are working against your interests. So I don't want to I don't want to imply that I never have meant to do that. Um, but at the same time, you know, we've reached this impasse and, and we need to resolve it. And hopefully we'll get th get it resolved here within the next week or so. That's my hope. I'm always hopeful, but things take longer than, um, you know, all things always seem to take longer than you expect. So I won't say any more about that other than uh, I think the news is good and we're headed in a good direction. I will, when I have something official to announce, I will, will definitely do so and let everybody know what's going on. I know people are curious, so I won't spend more time with that and let Jeff get ahead with the physics. Somebody, somebody, maybe Harry, I think it's you. Uh, yeah, it was. So mute yourself. If you want to be heard, then unmute. Roger P, maybe it's you. All right, Jeff, go ahead. Okay, thanks. Hi, my name is Jeff. Um, I put the link, uh, the direct link, for my paper, which is uh, um, the link on the uh, PowerPoint is incorrect. Um, I put it in the chat, so Greg, uh, you can you can see at the very bottom um, if you want to copy copy that one. That one should be working. Um, this discussion is largely based on two papers. Um, the combined, I had mentioned in my last presentation, I, I talked about um, my proposed proof for the Riemann hypothesis and. Uh, um, explain some of where, what the proof lies in and where, how it works, but there was a lot of math and um, now I want to show one aspect of the paper and how you can actually put it to use in, in terms of physics and, and it'll, it'll make the understanding of how I use the math in the paper to, to drive the message home. And uh, I'll, because I'm only describing one function um, I will breeze over a couple other functions that you can look up, but because I'm describing one aspect of it, it should be something that in two hours everyone can get a feel for. Um, I do believe that you will not get a full understanding until you actually uh, take the function or the mathematical tool and apply it to some real world, world problem yourself. Um, it's like a Fourier transform. You're really not going to understand what is going on with it until one day you actually sit down and, and do one for yourself. Um, but I will describe how to do that because even I've been talking with some mathematicians and that 
even for them, they're looking because this is new. They're like, I have no idea what this means. You had me here, but then you lost me here. Uh, so the paper, it, it contains a lot of information. It's 70 some pages long. And, uh, but you will see that everything that I go through is, is very workable. Um, it's very easy to do once you understand it and you get your head around it. At the end of this presentation, then I will show some of uh, um, uh, real world demonstrations. Hopefully, they show up on the camera. I got two videos in here. But uh, um, these two videos already have been shown elsewhere. Um, hopefully, I'll show you something new today. But I want to go through the math and the theory and what this is all about first. And so let's let's begin. All right. So we've all heard about uncertainty relations. Um, why they arise is largely um, been theorized by de Broglie, um, which is, states that every object in the universe is a wave, a situation which gives rise to phenomenon and about uncertainty relations. This is uh, um, typically the way they will be laid out. If ever you see them, one parameter times another is going to be greater than or less than or less than or greater than or equal to or less than or equal to some ratio, or it's um, approximately equal to this ratio. Typically, what happens with uncertainty relations when you see them, when you're working with them, is that you'll have two functions. Uh, let me see my horizontal. They're coming together, and then all of a sudden they lock, and then they're they're equal all the way through the rest of the function. It's not the same thing as converging. They kind of are separate, looking linear, like they're going to pass through each other. But when it gets to that point, it, it, they become uh, equal to infinity or wherever, whatever the part of the domain. Um, where, where it actually wants to go. I'm going to talk about them. I see these as a hard limit in most physical um, processes, and uh, I will show you what I'm talking with that. Um, they're, they're really interesting. Uh, when, when Heisenberg first came across his, he, he, didn't, he had no idea what it was he was looking at. There was a lot of debate. Um, it was Bohr said, you're misunderstanding what this means mathematically. It's more how we attribute the importance of the measurement, which gives rise to these. Um, basically, the, the standard uh, definition is um, if we know X, the more we measure it, the less we will know of Y. And this is, um, I'm going to show hopefully that it's not necessarily true in all cases. Um, it's a it baby saying something else, but it's it's going to take a long time to get to that. Um, but definitely, there is this mathematically. It does work as as they say. This as, conference as, as is being recorded. Here's somebody. Here's somebody. Okay. Well, let's keep let's keep well, going and uh, show on. And, uh, somebody's mic's on. Yeah. There we go. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, what is an object? Uh, I'm taking care of it as quickly as I can, Jeff. You're doing great. What is an object? Um, I'm going to start on a very low level so that everyone can keep up to speed, and then hopefully we'll only lose a few people as we go as it gets more complicated. But l objects are elements in a well-defined collection. So objects or elements themselves may be subsets. We all understand this, you know, but the set does not recognize that as a set itself. It recognizes it as an object. For instance, a, um, a basket of apples only recognizes apples as objects. And, um, well, you say, well, set, how does the set recognize it? I'll show you how, because mathematically, it doesn't recognize them as subsets themselves. But what we have, so just to understand what this is, elements, um, you can see here, it's an element is a set of fruit. Let's say apples are the elements and the set is the fruit. Well, then Macintosh apples can be elements of apples. And bruised Macintosh apples can be elements of of Macintosh apples, and you see it can go on and on and so forth. Very simple stuff. All right, so mathematical operations are used to manipulate these objects. Oper objects can be numbers themselves. Um, they're abstract objects rather than physical, ab uh, physical objects. But these uh, mathematical operations, all of them, can be applied to either real-world objects or abstract objects. Um, and the same, just from the, the de Broglie hypothesis, uh, numbers themselves can be described as waves. Um, and so you say, well, how, how, would, how would you describe it? You would call it an oscillation. There is basically with every complex number, this becomes very visible and understandable. 
um, for those who have worked with them. Uh, Euler showed some of this. Um, we're going to go and look at, we're just going to consider everything in the universe as an object, even a number. And then you will start to see how some of this, uh, some of these uncertainty relations come about. So, let's see. All right. So, if as earlier, what, for those just coming on, Greg and I went to Wikipedia to type in multiplication to find this, this uh, um, link to this uh, animated GIF. And if you go to addition at Wikipedia or subtraction at Wikipedia, you're going to get, oh, we know what addition is. It's an operation that describes the totaling of elements in a set. Subtraction, it's, it's the operation that describes the removal of elements in the set. Um, but if you get to multiplication and division, it, it's not so clear. It's like, well, it's an operation. And then let's move on to talk about how we use it. Because it's, there's not really a universal way to describe um, multiplication and division as of yet in the same way that we're describing or defining addition and subtraction. Typically, any definition of multiplication and division involves a circular definition which ties back to addition. And uh, for instance, um, the y and x divided by y, y we could say adds up is the number of elements required to add up to x. But that's a, a circular definition. It's describing it in terms of addition. At the top I put, up here I put totaling, oh, where's my pointer? Totaling, um, this is typically the way it's considered, but you'll see as I go on that isn't always the case. It is not always a form of totaling. Um, and so we'll get into that later. But uh, um, so I put made a note. In, in most cases, yes, but that is typically the way it's considered uh, addition. Why is this important? Because we're going to describe how addition, uh, additive operations and multiplicative operations have different physical meaning. And uh, here's the traditional way of looking at multiplication. You got four bags of marbles, but multiplication and division can only describe the element itself when speaking of one specific type of element. So we got these four bags of marbles. We could do this multiplication, but it has no idea what's if this is a green marble, a red marble, or a blue marble. It just knows it's got a bag of marbles. So you can say that the set is blind to any to any of the attributes of the uh, um, of the elements inside. And, or at least analyzing a, an equation with multiplication, it's going to be blind to any attributes of, the, of, of what's inside the element. And so, and I'll give, I'll give a couple examples on that. So, as we were talking before, um, there's this young guy, and he, I like his work not only for his animations, but also because he's looking at math in a different way, that maybe math, multiplication is, is, can be looked at in terms of, uh, um, in terms of scaling. And uh, I, I look at that, and I'm like, yeah, it could be scaling, or it could be a change, a, a change to the set, a turning, an orientation, translation, movement. So if you look at it as something that acts only on the set, we can look at it in terms of changing the set, where addition and subtraction only changes the elements. And I'll get to a couple, um, a couple examples here so you understand exactly what it is I'm talking about. Because of this, if we look at this way, you'll you'll understand why addition and subtraction um, describe the production or removal. I got rid of totaling, and I call it production of elements into a set. Now, we're not really necessarily, if you got an apple and you put a basket, it doesn't mean that I produced it and then I grew it. It means I produced it in the set. It doesn't matter where it came from. Once it comes into the set, is produced. And then we can start to look at that uh, in, in terms of... Uh, um, Addition. Now, we I put adding here in quotes. But adding here in quotes, when you look at this, is for this reason we can't add apples and oranges because we are describing the elements, the nature of the elements rather than the nature of the set. So one orange, one element A, added to I use add in quotes to a basket of two apples, two elements B, does not change the nature of the elements. Rather, the action produces a fruit basket out of an apple basket. It produces a new set. Therefore, it is multiplication uh, for, uh, operation, which is A times 2B equals 2AB. And as we were talking how we met multiplication cannot describe the elements, that 2 becomes arbitrary to our A or B. We met multiplication does not care if it's two apples or two oranges. It's got two fruits in its, in its set. Does, I hope this makes sense because it's going to become 
uh, it seems like, well, this is just a, you know, one way of looking at it, but you'll see you really, it helps to look at it this way when you start to get un, into uncertainty relation, relations. Um, in, the, in the same, addition may better describe the production of elements to a set, which is what I urge, rather than any form of totaling. And uh, let's, let's go on to this here, I'll show you. All right, now, if you keep going in this, in this process, you'll see that addition and subtraction can change the set, as well as multiplication and division change the set, but only by acting on the elements. So here's a, a very abstract example, natural numbers, natural number n minus natural number m equals an integer if and only if natural number m is greater than natural number n. For instance, 1 minus 2, it's now an integer. 1 is a natural number, 2 is a natural number, but you, you apply the subtraction, and we now have produced a new set. Now we are not in the set of natural numbers, we're in the set of, of uh, integers. And subtraction, the subtractive process or operation has, has done that. In comparison, in comparison, or you can even say in contrast, multiplication and division can change the elements inside, but only by acting on the set. And my uh, example here is if you got a box of bases and they're breakable and we can start scaling the set, the box, we start compressing it like in a trash compactor, the elements inside will break. And they'll break probably one at a time, some very close together, and each one will start to break and, and we are reducing, if we break all of the bases inside, it's no longer a box of bases. If we have a box of bases and porcelain dolls, and it's no longer it is now a porcelain doll base box. And we, let's say the porcelain dolls break first. Then we now have just, we have changed the nature of the set from porcelain doll base set to now a base set. And, and this, this is by acting on the set to affect the, um, the elements. So mathematics, the elements can affect the set. This works for action. I, I did a, a discussion a while back on action and the field and how an action inside the field can actually break the system, and also actions from outside the field can break the system. I use the example of a bus going around and a guy uh, around a turnabout, and then a guy in the inside, you know, does something to the bus driver, and the bus stops. That's that's disrupting from an action on the inside. So it's kind of the same way of looking at it. And you could look at this and 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 look at these different uh, mathematical operations from having different meaning. And this becomes clear as Mandelstrom and uh, Tom have uh, put in their paper in 1945, the same, they recognized the same thing. They just didn't recognize it as a mathematical operation. They said, well, this meaning, we'll get to it, this meaning is, has something very different than this meaning. One is a subtractive operation, the other is a ratio. And we'll get into how we do it. So let's uh, enter stage right, the conservation of energy in physics. The law of conservation of energy states that the total energy of an isolated system, keyword, cannot change. It is said to be conserved over time. So now we all are talking about when we're talking conservation of energy. So it's conserved over time. That means it is time dependent. All right. All right. Here's the paper. Um, I would encourage anyone really inter interested in this topic to read this paper. I'll tell you a little bit about uh, Mandelstam. Um, he's, he was from Russia, born in the 1800s, died the year this paper came out. And uh, Tom, his is, uh, um, well, let's say Mandelstam was, uh, Mandelstam was uh, his mentor, and he finished up the paper for him. Um, Tom had gone on to win Nobel Prize that had to do with light scattering when uh, that's very, very uh, it's, you see, it's all related. My paper talks a lot, a lot, a lot about light scattering. Um, and uh, I don't know if he's still alive. He was younger than him, but I don't know. I don't know what, what year he died. In any case, this work largely comes from Mandelstam. And uh, Tom uh, um, finished it up and put it in the paper. But here's the uncertainty relation that he found. It was shortly after the de Broglie hypothesis came about. So you have a uh, tau, which is uh, um, the half-life of the state. So we'll get into half-life. My paper is largely to do with uh, that aspect, exponential decay. Um, and the, the standard uh, um, energy, which is uh, the Hamiltonian, and which is the delta 
uh, capital H, is greater than or equal to Planck's constant times pi divided by 4. All right, so here we have the product. We have two um, properties that are very different that have some uncertainty relation between them and Planck's constant. The result of this is what is the equation below, which that appears that the energy or conservation of energy breaks down for very short periods of time. That was their their way of describing it um, in very short moments. Um, the conservation of energy may appear to be violated. You can also apply this, reapply this in terms of very high frequencies. So um, if you're talking about a wave, well, the, the time is, is, is inverse proportionate to inverse equal to the uh, um, frequency and, and back and forth. So you can look and say, well, what is happening at very high frequencies that is causing the uh, um, these apparent uh, um, quantum fluctuations? Well, there are quantum fluctuations, but apparent uh, violations of conservation of energy. And if we had a way of looking at them mathematically, then we could go in and study them. Um, it's given rise to a lot of, uh, um, well, a lot of debate, but uh, the scientific community does typically agree on a lot of aspects of this. They believe in the production of elements in this process. They also believe that they are very unstable. So they will pop in into existence and then they'll pop out of existence. Um, that is the general consensus. Um, whether or not that is... Uh, true or not is, is, is to be determined because to my understanding they're, they're not they're not uh, um, experimenting heavily on this you know they should be and I'm gonna go into some experiments you can do to test some of this all right so I'm gonna discuss well let's keep the next slide all right here's how they found it and, and you see how it ties into the beginning of what I wrote I'm just gonna read what they wrote this is from one page of their paper and it says a lot with the further propagation of the wave set, emphasis mine, the ratio h bar sub 2 over delta h sub 2, see it's a ratio and it's a set, increases until the whole set is turned, we were talking about scaling, turning, orientation, in the direction of q sub 2. It can also easily be seen that all the corresponding time intervals are increased. Now, from a different, entirely different meaning, what they say in... Uh, Monty Python, now on an entirely different subject. An entirely different meaning of the same result has the well-known relation which follows from perturbation theory. Which, look, it's a subtractive it's a subtractive operation. It says the same exact, it, it has the same exact result, but with very, two very different meanings. And where h sub 10, we, we talked is, is uh, um, those are, and, and h sub 20 denote the initial energies of the interacting systems or particles, I put emphasis in mine. These are the elements. One and two at the instant t equals two, t equals zero. Sorry. While h sub one and h sub two are the energies at instant t. All right. So there we're talking about one aspect. We're talking about the set, and now with the subtractive, we're talking about the elements. The proper energy of the particles, the elements, is by no means equal to the total energy of the system, the set, which for any isolated isolated system remains constant over time. In fact, the probability, a transition change of the system set from the initial state into a new state will take place during a time t is proportional to the oscillating function of time. This page sums up as it, everything I'm going to talk about, uh, I talked about in the paper, the, be, it being proportionated, proportionate to the uh, um, oscillating function of time for most of the rest of the paper, I'm going to talk about this oscillation function from my paper. All right. And you'll see everything else is going to fit exactly into what they were saying, you know, some decades ago. And the result is very, is, is extraordinary and gives a lot of hope for, uh, you know, future research in this area. So we're talking about sets and ratios and, and what that means and then the elements. And there's going to be some disconnect between how you see things from analyzing the set and how you see things analyzing elements themselves. There's going to be a little disconnect. All right. So this is, like I mentioned before, this is typically what people are looking at this to mean. 
is that conservation of energy can appear to be violated for small increments of time. This can also be interpreted to say that it's unstable. That any sort of, if you would have a system that was going to be producing more energy, then it's going to be unstable. That's one way of looking at it. Um, another way of looking at it is that it, if there's something going on at high frequencies that we can tap into, then to have you know surplus of energy. That's another way of looking at it. Um, but what typically the standard physics community looks at it is, is this is how matter is coming into production. Um, now, as I talked about with the the boxes and the thing, it doesn't matter where we get the apples. They came from somewhere, but we only look at it be they are produced in the set. So if new elements, let's say some uh, um, pions pop out in and out of existence, they came from somewhere. It's just mathematically looking at them, we will say they popped into our equation from nowhere. But we can still look at that mathematically from other aspects to say, hey, they came from this place or they came from this place. Whether it's somewhere else in the universe or some parallel universe, doesn't matter. But it doesn't say anything where they came from. It just says they now have arrived in this set. We have them and we can work with them. That is what conservation of energy says. It says it now allows the, for the production of how thing, new sets are formed. All right. So is there another way to look at this? And uh, I believe so. I'm not going to prove it so in this, but I, I believe so. And you can look at it in Planck's uh, um, constant. And um, I can prove one aspect of this. I will, sh I will demonstrate one aspect of it. Um, it doesn't say anything about Planck's constant as a physical entity. It just says what I'm going to show is that, hey, guess what? They become, this becomes equal to Planck's constant. What am I talking about? Angular momentum. Angular momentum has the same dimensions as um, Planck's constant. And it just as energy has the same physical dimensions as um, torque. Now, anywhere you read, you'll say, yeah, but they're completely different, uh, you know, um, phenomena of nature. That is uh, true in one sense that energy is conserved and, and uh, torque has no concept of that because torque doesn't have to do with frequency. It is an action over time. Energy is an action pertaining to a frequency. So they're going to have, diff they're going to look a lot different. They may be something very different. We're going to study what is it, why then, if energy is always conserved, is it not always equal to this, you know, um, uh, reduced, you know, constant or uh, um, Planck's constant, this ratio? What, why would this happen mathematically? And then we're going to go and look at that. And then when we look at that, you can go and study these different areas. Well, L here is angular momentum, and it is basically the cross product of the position vector and linear momentum. Well, right there, there's another uncertainty relation, which was the original one found by Heisenberg. Well, that you can't know the exact location or position, or the position and the momentum of a particle, you know, in the atom at the same time. Well, we're using an uncertainty relation that goes and applies to uh, um, angular momentum. So we got a couple of these right in the same area, so it, it makes it difficult to do some of the math. Um, and uh, so we're going to basically analyze is h always constant and is there some other way to apply this function to uh, or is Planck's constant a hard limit that angular mo momentum can get up to and then it becomes equal to out to infinity so Planck's constant is constant it's just a value but is there some natural process that a Planck's constant represents a hard limit to and that's what we're going to look at my favorite way to look at angular momentum is with a gyroscope. Um, John and I, we've been talking about gyroscopes so, uh, since he's arrived, and uh, I still think that they're the, um, the most phenomenal toy in the world. But uh, I'm going to go over and show some of the uh, um, basics of it. All right. This is the inner guts of an exercise product, the, the gyro ball, the power ball, power Power B, there's many different, Dyna B, there's many different uh, versions of this. I think they came about in the 1950s. Basically, you got this flywheel, a heavy uh, metal wheel in the center, which is one. Oops, let me get my marker. I'm using my cursor. Um, this is the flywheel in the middle, and it's weighted, and it spins freely on uh, um, two, some rod, um, and which is fixed. 
I'm not sure if it's allowed to pivot. I don't think it's allowed to pivot in this uh, um, frame three. And uh, frame, th frame three is, uh, I believe, locked into four. You get to the important thing is that the important one is that this pivot point from frame four and a six actually is allowed to spin freely and it's allowed to um, slide up and down. It, it has to have friction in, in this area in order to, uh, um, so they use like a synthetic rubber, so it slides, it's difficult to slide, but it needs to be able to give. What happens then is if you use a rip cord or a motor to spin this, to rev this flywheel up to very high velocities, you know, even 10,000 RPMs or more, the, uh, um, you can maintain that spin indefinitely just by precessing it. And you can also increase the internal spin. I'm only talking about doing it about this much. We'll keep it going. And then you can increase the speed the spin by great magnitudes by speeding it up. When it gets to that point, the reason it's an exercise product, it doesn't want to leave that point in space. It is very difficult. Once it's going, it doesn't want to be moved here. It's a very interesting phenomena. Um, I don't know if it's really good for the wrist, but um, I got a competitive product I'm putting out. But basically, um, this is the uh, physics here. You can study every aspect of every aspect of angular momentum uh, and frequency ratios and all, all this we're going to talk about with a gyroscope. So um, you can also do it with an experiment that most of you know about uh, if you've followed any of my work. I'm going to show a quick video that I did in 2010 um, just to show another way to st study angular momentum and the constant forms of angular momentum. And so I will just uh, play this video. Um, it's going to be quiet uh, versus everyone seeing this. All right. It's going to get noisy all of a sudden out of the blue. Um, some of this has changed. This is one of the earlier versions of the experiment. Um, but basically what we're talking about is creating a standing wave from a, a pulse and where we can study a constant uh, version of um, Franklin Hugh. Yes. Really, you can keep you guys from being by twisting it around. Um, Franklin, yes, check it out. There's lots of videos. All right. Alex says the video is not visible. Is it not visible to everyone? I need a comment. I see it just fine, but it's not playing. Did you play it? I, I hit play. I just stopped <clears> it just now. Okay. That's interesting. I, 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 it, I it, playing. Yeah. So that's playing that's, for us. Can I try it? Let me see if my playing it makes a difference. Okay. It's playing now for me. Is everybody else oh, seeing it now? I think everyone can hit play on their own screen, maybe. Maybe. Everyone can click on a video themselves. All right, wait, everyone hit stop. We're going to all start at the same time. All right, everyone hit stop because that's the only way we're going to watch this. Oh, that's crazy. Well, we can't yeah, all be at the weird. same time. Uh, well, we, need to be, we need to be fairly close to because, I mean, so we all see the same thing. Okay, but, so everybody, how do we get get your cursor back to the beginning? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we'll do ready, set, go. <laughs> ready, set, go. You'll have a play button on your screen. Okay. <clears throat> if, you're, if you take your cursor and you scroll over it. Should be over in this area. It doesn't play. It doesn't play. It loaded only first picture, guys. Mine well, plays okay. Every, other people are playing it. How did you take uh, your Franklin cursor? Franklin says he doesn't over. have a play button. Hmm. You got to scroll I just over assume it. that if, if one of us, uh, that we would all see the same thing. How crazy is that? Okay. Well, you can go on YouTube if you miss it. You got it. Yeah. You got to roll your mouse over. I know you guys are just not doing it. Take your cursor, roll over the video icon, and the and the play button will appear. That works, guys. That works. That's good. Well, we're not all synced anymore. All right. All right, there's 
There's one aspect of it, probably something you won't be able to hear if it's at a noisy part, um, where it gives a close-up from the side. You want to look at that one to get an idea of what the, the motions are of this. I can turn mine off so you don't hear my echo. I'm gonna turn. I'm gonna turn mine off so you guys don't hear it because my mic's on and that way it's not distracting. Because I've already seen it, and I already know what it's doing. <clears throat> At around eh, about just past halfway of the video, there's a close-up from the side. And you can look at it, and what you'll see if you watch carefully throughout this is that there are, there are four motion induced on the uh, magnet. There's one which is causing it to flip, which is basically all the signal does, is it gets a magnet to flip. By restricting its flippage on the top, it's got a, it still has the potential of energy to move from the amount of energy given to it. It wants to move because it still has that energy. And so it, instead of moving, flipping this way, which you can't go any further, it tends to turn. And then as it starts to reverse, that turn induces um, a precessional motion and a spin. Additionally, nutation. So it's going to and from the inside to the outside. And the fourth motion, it's going around. So you got four motions, precession, spin, nutation, and orbit, I call. All right. You get the same motions with the gyroscope with the exception of the orbit. All right. You still get a little nutation, and you get some, you definitely got spin and precession um, with the gyro balls particularly. But if you've ever seen a gyroscope, you'll see it often is kind of going like this as it's spinning. But with the gyro ball, it's, it's significant. You have to precess. That is the connection between the precession and and the spin. Is everyone done watching the video? Because I'm going to move to the next uh, slide. And just let me go. I don't think it's that long. Okay. All right. So I got this this hypothesis, uh, and it's forming. And it, I want to apply it to. Uh, well, it's already been formed, but I want to apply it then to uncertainty relations based on. This angle, angular, uh, angular momentum, velocity, and I call it the specific trajectory hypothesis, for lack of a better, better name. But it's basically sent just like a, um, a satellite is put into uh, the Earth. It hits a certain angle at a certain velocity, and it's going to become a self-sustaining system that's going to continue to orbit. It doesn't mean that you know it wasn't a small and got larger. It just means that if we put something at an angle that it's going to do. We know that. We recognize that this happens in, in the universe. Now, is my, my understanding, does the math in that apply to the production of all systems? Can we say that every system that um, wasn't sp spontaneously, you know, by chance, fluke, um, uncertainty, can it, uh, um, was it really set in motion with, for a reason? Like, like, because it came at that angle, you know, not some uh, you know, higher, you know, bigger world picture reason, but it's there because it was put in that direction, and it's there. You may not understand how it got there, but basically it's there because something or someone or something how caused it. So the, the hypothesis is, is very uh, simple, straightforward, that I think all self-sustaining systems, a standing wave set, whose decay may, may be measured exponentially, like an atom, uh, is formed, the set is produced, when its objects are produced in a set at a specific trajectory in three spatial dimensions, as opposed to arising from spontaneous, non-deterministic causes. Yes, it is opposed to the, the um, nature of the uncertainty principle. So um, here's, how, here's the math. We're going to learn every aspect of what's on this page, and, uh, um, and I'm going to go into it in depth and show what each aspect of it is. Um, Basically, we have 
a function, and it's an oscillation. It can be used to describe a wave. It can be used to describe a probability. It can be used for just about anything, even a number. Any object can be descri described with this function. All right, how? What does it involve? It involves theorems of, of uh, um, uh, the fundamental theorem of algebra, fundamental theorem of arithmetic. Um, a number of math, a very strong mathematical theorems are all tied into this and, and to what it's about to, what to do. So it is in the little Laplace, Laplace, I can't say it, Laplace or Laplace uh, transform. Anyway, it's, it's similar to a Fourier transform, except that a Fourier transform um, represents... That would be Laplace. Sorry, Laplace. you asked. <laughs> names, I can't get names right. I did ask, thank you. Um, it, it represents um, a function, a wave oscillation, instead of like a Fourier transform, in terms of seconds and chronological order in terms of moments. So what happened here is the way we can describe that wave. What happens here, we can describe that wave at that aspect. So uh, aspect in time. Uh, moments can apply to a number of different ways if you talk in time, or it can, in some ways, you can do it in terms of distance. But it definitely um, it doesn't describe them linear. And, and this is in that form, which is um, the, the function is most simply put is uh, a subtractive operation minus, uh, equal to a ratio. Now, this almost is uh, an uncertainty relation, except that it becomes more useful to work with if you apply the uncertainty, and this is because it's an abstract concept, um, we can apply the uncertainty aspect, the uncertainty relation to how we define the first value of the chi function in the upper right hand corner. Does everyone see, see my cursor? All right. So the uncertainty relation lies that this ratio is then therefore exactly equal to this um, subtractive operation, which gives the, the function. All right. That function expanded. You can see the subtractive operation here is the inverse limit minus this other aspect. All right. And we'll get into that. All right, so I'm going to first start, oh, and how you determine the period, which we're going to go into, has to do with a greatest common divisor, and how you could be using a greatest common divisor for numbers that are integers, we will show you can do this with polynomials, um, and it is accept, perfectly acceptable mathematically. All right, so we're going to go in and talk about these uh, each one of these components, and you will get an understanding of what all of this means. But we're gonna we're showing then a, a, um, a relationship. I can tie this function to any uncertainty relation, and I, and I can get a, a defined output and what it exactly it means, depending on how you define each parameter. The most common way to define what I have here is sigma is an attenuation constant. All right. So if we're going to use this function in terms of light propagation, then we would just call this an attenuation constant. Um, because that is where it, it it's currently in, in um, telecommunications or physics, that is the only um, usage of this value, of this variable. However, this variable, oh, also in exponential decay, it is also being used, but it's symbolized a little different. All right. In my paper, in the proposed proof of the Riemann hypothesis, this value would be the real part of S. There is no difference between this mathematically from the attenuation constant. So you see that's where it is throughout this page. Um, it is the argument that we are applying to the function. So there's two arguments to apply to the function, and everything else can be calculated out of that. It is the real part and an imaginary part, which is omega we'll get to. Let's talk about what the attenuation constant is for an example of a real-world uh, phenomena. Okay, the term attenuation constant only has meaning to this when discussing the oscillation function in terms of wave. I kind of mentioned that. We're, we're, we can apply this to uh, probabilities. We can use the function in many different ways. Here, we would be using it as um, the attenuation constant. So if you hear me call an attenuation constant when I'm talking about dimensionless properties, don't scream at me. Just understand it's the same. I'm, I'll try my best. Just refer to it as sigma, okay, for now. All right, so... Um, it can be considered real time or the real part of S and zeta function, but the attenuation of an electromagnetic wave propagating through a medium per unit distance 
from the source is what it really is, it, it, what it's typically used as. It is the real part of the propagation constant and is measured in, in napers, I believe you say napers or nepers. I have no idea because I don't use nepers. It's an amplitude, basically. It's approximately 8.7 decibels. Attenuation constant can be defined by an amplitude ratio, and here it is. Now, the only difference, and I, I just discussed both of these in my paper, the only difference between this and um, the same relationship in exponential decay is that they use n as the quantity decaying rather than the amplitude decaying. So just replace n and a. And then typically um, for exponential decay, it is not the absolute value. The uh, it would be the equivalent would be n sub zero would be in the denominator, and then we would have um, a negative in the exponent to the right. It, it's basically just inverted of, of each other. It's, it's the same exact expression, um, just being used for different um, uh, used for different purposes. So if we're talking about communications, we would we would go to uh, um, we would discuss the propagation. All right, we're talking about exponential decay then we would go to discuss it in terms of a quantity. Oh, oh, so amplitude amplitude decaying over distance as opposed to a quantity deca decaying over time. You just got to change the dimensions with, with what we were discussing. Somebody's mic just turned on. It is J3. Please, thank you. Maybe not. All right. Um, okay. So, in, in in essence, in a, in a large portion of the uh, um, paper, a lot of the point where people get annoyed and don't and want to fall asleep is the, when I'm doing the derivation, uh, applying the Bucky, Buckingham Pi theorem to it. Uh, basically, in a paper, all I'm doing is I'm reducing all the dimensions, showing that these certain quantities um, converge to zero, so that I can show express them in terms of abstract uh, numbers rather than carrying all the physical dimensions over throughout. It becomes easier because I apply this to number theory and, and therefore physical dimensions, you know, lose importance. All right, um, so large portion of the paper is, is describing it as a um, dimensionless constant. Okay, the phase constant or phase change, this is a, um, omega in the function. This is the other argument. It is imaginary, um, it is imaginary argument but the value can be applied in um, for a real function, and that's discussed on a different slide. Um, so it, uh, in his equation here, we are talking about real numbers. This is the value of the imaginary part. It is not an imaginary number in the denominator. It is not an imaginary or a complex number over to the right. It is the value. All right, um, so that's what we're talking about. What is phase change? <clears throat> if we're still talking about uh, sigma being attenuation constant, now we will then refer to uh, omega as the phase constant. Phase constant is actually not constant at all, it fluctuates, um, so better to describe the changes of the phase throughout the cycle. All right. In electromagnetic theory, the phase constant also calls phase change constant. Parameter of coefficient is the imaginary component of the propagation constant for a plane wave. It represents the uh, plane wave being the length. Um, it represents the change in phase per meter along the path traveled by the wave at any instant and is equal to the real part of the angular wave number of the wave. <coughs> so, as you see, the, it, the value being equal to the real part of the angular wave number is actually what is applied to the, the function. All right, So that's why that's there and not an imaginary value. It is typically represented by the symbol B. I use uh, beta, no, B, beta. I use beta for a different variable, so I'm using omega. And <laughs> the reason I chose uh, omega is because it is very is proportional to angular frequency and angular or, or angular velocity. Very proportional, and this can be proven. Um, and uh, where this is interesting of what, how I wanted to apply it. Now they're not the same property, but they're proportionate. And so since I'm, I want to have the value there, I use the value of angular momentum. So people always kind of look at it with is something tied to there with angular velocity and this value. All right. Um, okay. This is the way the propagation constant would look. Um, the, the symbolized with gamma. It, the, basically, these arguments that we apply to this function is, is basically the propagation constant. It is it is measure of change undergone by the amplitude of the wave as it propagates in a given direction. 
the quantity being measured to be the voltage or current, and so on and so forth. Again, this has different meanings when discussing exponential decay. But we can, I'm, I'm given one example um, so that you can get, your, get, an, um, get an understanding of it before I discuss the rest. Um, but just so you understand, you can't apply this then to exponential decay. It's just typically symbolized with different variables, or <clears throat> but it, it has the same general meaning. Mathematically, it is the same thing. Okay, so here is the uncertainty relation. And uh, I showed it on the first page. And we're going to show exactly what are the values output from the function. 1 divided by h. h is not Planck's constant. This is a problem doubling up of, of variables. H here is not Planck's constant. I should have changed it to k. It's just except that I do not discuss Planck's constant in the paper. So if you get to the paper, you go, that's Planck's constant. It is not. It is just a symbol. Sorry about that. Um, not enough letters in the alphabet. All right, so we have this, and the uncertainty relation arrives at the value, the, the, uh, the initial value, and the value of the chi function at zero argument. Um, when you have a function that you can determine a lot at that value, um, and we're going to go on with what you can do. How does it look from what is output from the function by applying some arguments? Let's apply some arguments. All right, here we have six values of the function with the, here it says real part of s. We can just say that's the sigma. Um, the real part would be one half, which is the interesting aspect of the Riemann hypothesis. And then we apply natural numbers. We got six of them, zero, one, zero, two, three, four, five um, arguments for the, um, the, uh, the phase change um, argument, the imaginary part. And we skip over all this in the middle. It's not necessary for you. And the um, function output is here. I have phi. This is not phase. Please understand. It is the, the oscillation function. Well, it doesn't look like it's oscillating at 1 half. It outputs the values 1 half. Um, this is the only function where it outputs uh, values of 1 half, where the real part equals the function output. It happens to be a 1 half. There's more on that in the paper. But the point is for the uncertainty relation is for all values fairly large, like one fourth or larger, the first value of the chi function is not equal to, it is less than, no, the chi function is larger than the, it's similar, whatever property it is. That function, let me go back here. On. This side of the equation which involves the attenuation constant or sigma is going to be less than the actual value of the chi function at um, at argument zero okay so at one point in the function that value becomes equal all the way to infinity now we're going into smaller infinity in this uncertainty relation now let's keep on going you see we put different arguments I only threw a few examples so I could put them on the same page so you see it does oscillate uh, uh, for the argument one-third. It oscillates for all of them. It's just these are the sweet spots where they're the same value. We'll get into that later. All right. Um, and you see when you go down to different arguments, now you see, oh, yeah, 10 is equal to 10, 20 is equal to 20, 32 is equal to 32. This is very simple doing it with natural arguments. The, um, the value, I said it was a ratio. The value of the function output is very simple. Here, 20 divided by 49 happens to equal 0 0.4081. So that ratio is very uh, um, uh, is, is always accurate. It's But we need a way to find its value at 0, 0.0, and we cannot do it for all arguments that are very large. That's just where the uncertainty relation arises. Why do we only care about that, this first one? Because at that point, we can then take the function. We can. Um, we can determine its phase, we can determine its period, its maximum amplitude, and then perform a Fourier, uh, apply a Fourier series to it and know everything else about the function. So we only need that initial value to give us some working uh, ground. All right, so that's the uncertainty relation. You see it's, it looks like it's, it's getting closer, and then all of a sudden it locks in, and it's equal all the way to the infinity. The first value is, all, is always equal. Now, because this is used with a... Um, uh, in number theory, we can apply it to some real-world phenomena, but I'm going to get there, but I have to define all the rest. All right, what is a field of fractions, and how could it possibly be 
use in terms of real numbers, which are like real world measurements, right? Because field of fractions is typically just uh, rational numbers, fractions. And uh, um, so it's very easy for my paper to be used because we're talking about, um, you know, every, it's in number theory, it's going to always be rational numbers. My, my point here is you can take this outside of that realm, and I'll explain why and why, why it would be useful. All right. What is the field of fractions in the first place or the, uh, um, the uh, field of quotient? All right. Well, it is an integral domain of the smallest field in which it can be embedded. The elements of the field of fractions of the integral domain are the reals have the form A over B with A and B in real and B not equal to zero. And if you ever use this function from my paper, you'll see, no, there is no argument you could possibly apply to the real part of S, the imaginary part that is ever going to give it equal to zero. It just, it can't, it doesn't happen. It never will mathematically happen. But you will know that it's a field of fractions when you have these conditions. What it, what it is. Um, Traditionally, it's only considered for rational values and that the meaning behind the division operation is that the denominator is the number of parts required to add up to the whole. We already just talked, this is really a circular definition because mathematically, it works in terms of any change to the set as well. Scaling, orientation, oscillation. When you apply it this way mathematically, it gives meaning. Um, and the reason we can do this is because any field may be used as a scalar to a vector space. Any field. Field of fractions, doesn't matter what it is. Thus, it can be said that a field of frequency, this is for example, of an integral domain is the smallest field in which it can be embedded, which means like it's the smallest frequency or condition that we can turn it to where it will continue to do something like it's doing. All right, so, or if it's a maximum, then it's the, uh, um, it would be the smallest, if it's talking maximum space, then smallest amount of, uh, I don't know, whatever, or least amount of freedom agreed movement, whatever it is how you apply it. But it is basically, you can apply it to the set. And then it takes on a little different meaning. But that is what it is. You can actually, it's very easy to calculate that value um, from the real part. It is dependent on the real part of, of or the attenuation constant, or the real part of S in the paper. And, uh, okay, so... What is this? Well, it's, it's a polynomial. Um, for instance, if n equals um, 1 and you apply it to here, then n plus 1, of course, is 2, and then you've got a quadratic. Um, there, there's an interesting property to it, and I'll, sh I'll go on to it. So what is the polynomial of the field of frequency for one interval? What is it? That is it right here, and let's see how, it, uh, um, how we use it. All right. It has its roots in infinity. When applying it as a quadratic equation, the only arguments that will send it to zero are as positive infinity and negative infinity. And, uh, um, and in that case, when that happens, the field of fractions or field of quotients uh, it becomes equal to minus one. So we know it has some significance for uh, um, when, we, when dealing with the roots. And you'll see, I'm going to discuss the roots as we move forward. Uh, what they mean when they arise in certain functions, the function itself, when taking certain arguments, it looks it has this oscillation. So you have a, con a convergent oscillation over one interval. So what does that mean? So if you take in that whole, um, if you take the entire oscillation function, the one we're talking about, big long one, all right, and we take it from there to infinity, first we have to run this oscillation to get that first value. So if we have argue, argument, uh, um, uh, oh, here we go. Um, real part three and the uh, um, imaginary part uh, eight. Well, then this is, we have to first take this oscillation down to find where it converges. We need that value. And that value, and this one happens to be somewhere between 0 0.04 and 0 0.03. Suffice to say, Every argument in here converges. It is there is no possible way to have even using minus three as arguments. Uh, it's always going to converge, which is very fortunate because it makes it possible to do this function. Um, so this is this is how the one interval you have to run this infinite um, uh, function first. Okay, it's not hard. Okay, um, but that's where it is, and we need that value. All right. Um, we were talking about roots before, and we're going to go talk about the roots of um, 
uh, Hermitian matrix. All right. Here we are only interested. We're only interested in the real part. But well, first, you have to understand what it's real part of before you can really have any understanding of it. Well, any general polynomial has, um, whether it's real or comp, with coefficients real or complex, has complex roots, n number of them, n quantity of complex roots. Those complex roots are these values that are output from the function. All right, this, that is the z function. Now, I have a way of generating this function to generate these roots. And, uh, and that's how we'll do it, based on the real part and the imaginary part as arguments. But in the real world, or in, in the mathematical world too, what it is, it's the function that produces the elements in the Hermitian matrix of the propagation constant, or S, if you're talking about number theory in, in the Riemann, Riemann uh, or the uh, zeta function. All right, it's trace of the matrix. If you don't know what matrix is, just ignore everything I have to say. It's trace, it can be determined from this value. Um, what is this delta function? I'll describe it in a second. Um, it is also tied to the field of fractions from this equation. Minus six, 16 times the field of fractions times the limit of the absolute value of the z function squared equals 1. And uh, it always will equal that. It's, that's how it is intricately linked in here. Uh, they are the roots involving the polynomial of the divisor function. What is that divisor of? Um, that divisor is the divisor of field, the, the, um, the field of fractions, or the field of frequency, however you want to apply it. So there's a numerator, denominator. The denominator is this delta um, function. Remember we said the field has to be a, um, a rational number or expressed in terms of divisibility? Well, that means if it's a rational number, it's a fraction, then it's got a numerator and denominator. This function represents the denominator. The numerator, as shown in the paper, the first half of the paper, or first section of it, it's showing that the numerator always goes to 1. It always converges to 1 in terms of exponential decay in using it in this way. So if the numerator always goes to 1 and you got a denominator, guess what we can do by the limit? We can just invert it and then we get uh, we get the limit of the delta function. This um, relationship here is very, very interesting. Um, by applying all this, how you see how each one is connected to the other, the inverse of the real part of the, the, the root function is equal to the coefficient a sub 0 over a sub n, which is equal to the real part of the propagation constant, or of s, plus the mean variance of the periodic triangular function, which is that function we're talking about. That's the We call it periodic triangular function, uh, or probability oscillation, but that is that is the mean variance of that. Um, that's how it's all connected. Now, how to Use, i got to define a few other things, and we can go and put it to work. Greatest common divisor. Well, how can you say a greatest common divisor has any meaning in terms of a wave? Well, we talked about how numbers can be represented, uh, described as waves. So, but you have to understand, what does it mean, though? You can't say it's greatest common divisor or greatest common uh, factor. No, that doesn't really have a lot of meaning. In a paper, fortunately, I'm using um, real numbers, but we want to apply it to physics and see how it works. Can you, um, how do we describe that? Well, you describe it in terms of polynomials. And, and you can do this uh, from algebra. All right, the greatest common divisor, GCD, of two polynomials is a polynomial of the highest possible degree. That is a factor of both the two original polynomials. This concept is analogous to the greatest common divisor of two integers. In the important case of univariate polynomials over the field, the polynomial GCD may be computed, like for the integer, by Euclid's algorithm. Thank you, uh, Euclid. Uh, the main difference lies, here is the meaning, that there is no natural total. Remember I talked, I said I'm, I'm going to reserve the right to change the definition of addition in, in terms of total. There is no natural total when you're using this in this way. It is, therefore, greatest is meant for the relation of divisibility. It has to do more with the set. I hope some of you are, are following on the key points to what I'm saying. <clears throat> then you see maybe uh, you see how it tied, tied in with what I was describing earlier. Um, all right, is this relation we're talking about uh, uncertainty relations? We're also talking about all sorts of relations, but the relation is only a preorder. The polynomial GCD is defined only up to the multiplication by an invertible constant. You use it all over whatever you need to deal with, but you see it, and where it's defined, 
It's, it's, it's a discuss, discussing the invertible constant, all right? The similarity between the integer GCD and the polynomial GCD allows us to extend to univariate polynomials all the properties that may be dedu deduced from Euclid. Thank you, Euclid. All right. So since the sum, product, or composition, derivative, or antiderivative of a polynomial is a polynomial itself, a period defined by the greatest common divisor in a polynomial oscillation, such as our wave function that we were discussing, would mean that it describes the greatest relation of divisibility, how much the set can be changed, how fast the speed of light can get to, how small an electron can be. Um, this is what we're talking about. It's talking about how to scale what is the smallest amount, all right? It is representative of a hard limit. <clears throat> hard limit meaning it's, it's rising and then it can't go any higher, so it's got that glass ceiling go and it's never going to go above that. All right, no matter how much energy or whatever, it's, it's, it's stuck there. It's locked in. That's where all of this uncertainty relationship relations are coming from, as I, I believe. All right. Factoring polynomials is very difficult. Um, when you start to get to, <coughs> excuse me, very large powers, I mean, it's, it's very difficult. Quadratic equations, pretty easy. You can do this in elementary arithmetic, but it gets pretty difficult. Um, this function makes it very easy. You can, you can do this in paper. I'm outputting factors, and, and it takes two seconds. It takes no time. It's a, what do they call it, polynomial time. It's, 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 a, it's a fastest version. I can do an Excel spreadsheet, a number of these, and it factors it out instantly because mathematically they are locked. One outputs another. So you want to know what are the primes that add up to this number? You put it in there. The minus S equals, you know, 18, and it outputs those factors in, in, in Wiki Split. You can do it from polynomials, represent it as polynomials. You can represent it in any way. This is um, the beauty of this function, and, and all of what I'm talking about is how much more efficient it makes mathematics. All right, but it's a big, you know, it's a big function. All right, it's a lot there. But like I said, if a computer is, it, it doesn't, rec doesn't care how big that is. And a Excel, Excel spreadsheet, you can put this up there, determine all of these things, have one column. Uh, you know, calculate the limit, and, and it's, it's, it takes no time. But you got to make sure that every part of this is right before you get some interesting values. All right, modulo. I'll tell you, I have had uh, unwarranted flack from this, but you're going to see how it, it's, it's unwarranted. I know the great mathematician John Nash, who they made a movie about, which was complete fiction, actually, but uh, um, still introduced him and his concepts um, in a beautiful mind. He went to pr attempted in improving the Riemann hypothesis with some of this aspect. Now, I can't say that I know his approach entirely, but people laughed at it and said, yes, see, he is crazy. Um, no, it's, it's very, very interesting, especially when you apply it to physics. What could the modulo in physics really say? Well, let's look at it in terms of computing. Computing is great because it drops all of these um, ar archaic definitions that number theorists came up, as though the, the natural number 2 has any more importance than, you know, uh, 2.168 or whatever. Just because we, uh, we can count on our fingers the number 2 doesn't mean it mathematically has any, you know, meaning. Well, so computers are very good at just ignoring all of those definitions and showing um, it doesn't violate them, it just it shows how it really can be um, understood. So in computing, the operation finds the remainder of division of one number divided by a number, another, right? So given two positive numbers, A, the dividend, and the divisor, A mod N is the remainder of the Euclidean division of A by N. Therefore, it doesn't matter if it's an integer or natural number or whatever. It could be a polynomial, it could be a complex number, it's, it's very uh, straightforward. All right. So, in terms of the early definition of division as change to the set, we can state that the modulo is the remainder of the amount of change required for the set to get to a specific value. If we have the smallest point, like let's just say uh, the maximum speed of light the light can get to, okay, and we're going at 10 miles per hour, this can tell you how much further we have to go. We do perform this equation. It can show how much more it needs to be scaled to. If we have a circle, we have a degree angle, we could say, oh, we have this much more. That is the remainder of what we have to go after performing some function. So you see, it's the amount of yet need to scale or orient to, to meet a specific condition. That's all it means. It's, it's very straightforward and it's not crazy. It's very normal. All right, in A mod N, this is where it gets 
interesting because every programming language seems to output different values. Now, I don't know what Mathematica does, but uh, um, it can become, uh, this becomes, as Wikipedia describes, um, it comes from a naive uh, definition of the modulo function that, uh, um, in, in that, the definition does not include all possible remainders. There may be one negative, maybe one positive. A number theorist choose choose the positive number typically, um, but I can tell you that there may be certain cases where the negative has greater meaning. It depends on what you're doing. Excel chooses the positive, and that is the correct remainder for this function. Um, I've gone to some online uh, ar arbitrary precision um, apps, and they're they're calculating it in the other way, and it's not useful. I don't know what, how Mathematica. Hopefully, they I'll put. Uh, the two values when it comes to this condition. Um, basically, if the remainder is non-zero, then there are two possible choices for the remainder, one negative and another positive. Now, if you're talking about a polynomial, then you get more than just two <laughs> answers. You know, they, so it's, it, it, you got to really, um, it, it's tricky, and I, I'd like to see in the future more people define this. Fortunately, for the purposes of this, you can pull up an Excel spreadsheet, and it's going to output the numbers as you want them. In the paper, there is nothing um, that can't be done on an Excel spreadsheet. In fact, I have an Excel spreadsheet with all of the equations if anyone wants a copy. All right, but it's a mess, I should say. It is a mess. All right, so what are the consequences of these mod this modular operation in the probability oscillation? Uh, well, let me just state some what happens when certain things are certain values. Okay, um, well, for all positive arguments, of the real part, uh, positive greater than zero, that is, um, the oscillative fu oscillation function will act as a probability. So it's going to return values zero to one, and, and that's it. Um, so if you want to do something else, then you go through negatives and you work with negatives. I use negative aspects to do factoring, which is what I talked about before. What? How does the modular um, uh, operation, modulo um, operation work on this? Well, when the field mod h, h was that you no longer span, I, I symbolize it with h, not Planck's constant, it equals h, then that sends the uh, um, the probability to 1. It means it's 100% certain. Um, whenever it's, you know, those are equal, the function is an output 1. So it's very nice. If you want to know all the arguments that output 100% certainty of some situation, you can go and you know that it's going to be there because it outputs, it's going to be because h is equal to that modular function. So you see it is it is connected to it. When the, um, the field mod h equals 0, it's, it tells us something between the real part and the uh, function itself, all right? which provides a really neat mathematical tool. So if we want to know, say we have this function, we're talking about, and we we'll actually use this example in one of my experiments, I want to know all the conditions that in this function that make the angular momentum or the angle um, theta to be at 90 degrees or, or pi divided by 2. Well, then I, I, it's very easy because of the fact that this uh, real part, the negative, is equal to the, uh, um, the function. I can set the, um, the imaginary arguments to be, uh, where is it, the desired value, the negative desired value minus the real part will always output those to, you know, interested values. If we want that, if we want that value, then it's very easy. We say if our desired value and then our arguments for the imaginary part are negative pi divided by 2 example minus the, the real part, and we're always going to get, and I promise you it's going to be guaranteed, we're always going to get that value output from the function. And then we can go and look at all the other aspects, you know, to see what determined, you know, that condition. Now, angle is important if you're talking trajectory. We want to apply certain angles, so it's good to know that. All right, this is how it all comes from the modular consequence uh, of this. All right, um, now there's two, um, I would say there, oh, I'm missing the other constant. And I'll come about it in a second. This is what, there's two constants in this function, this oscillation function. I'm still describing every aspect of it, so I understand you're like, where is this going? I'm just describing the different points of the function. There are two, um, constants. There are points that are typically of interest in this function. They represent the regions which it goes to zero. Basically, you can add any argument to this function um, with the single exception of 
real part minus one half. Um, that is undefined. Okay, but we have this is one of the uh, um, one of the constants. It is on the negative side. There's another constant for the positive side, and these uh, points represent the, the uh, points that go send the function to infinity. And it's a very interesting area of the. We're going to go there when we start talking about Planck's constant, so you're going to see what I'm talking about. Here. All right, when the probability is one half, when it's completely uncertain, if we're using the function to describe probabilities, um, we always get this ratio that the modular aspect, or the, the field mod h, is divisible by 8. The reason why, even if you're talking about angles, even if we're talking about irrational numbers, you're still going to say you have to look at it as though, we well, don't have to look at it, it's going to be very little or no whether you want it or not, but it, there's, there's going to be 8 in the denominator. The reason is it comes from the polynomial um, way to determine um, our uncertainty relation. All right. Now, if you look, I showed you the uncertainty relation earlier. Oh, here it is. The first value of the chi function is greater than or equal to this, you know, this kind of, I call it ugly, <laughs> ugly uh, equation. It just doesn't look like a whole lot, but it's very significant. All right, but it has to be laid out this way because it produces results that are unsolvable by going back the other way. All right, so you see where the, the minus 8 is. By rearranging to solve for the real part in this function, let's say we take off the chi function for all values where it is equal. We all know that it's equal for very small values, less than one-fifth if, if you're talking about rational numbers. Okay, so we can just study that function in there to set this to equal to rearrange um, for the real part, the attenuation constant or sigma, from the chi function, its value is zero. Um, the only argument you can't uh, um, apply to that, um, that quadratic, is minus 8. And the reason is because there's only one value for minus 8, and that is, is one third. All right, so that is how the 1, 8 got in there. It is a fundamental part, and it's discussed in the, in the paper um, why it arises. But that's why you're always going to get that fraction, this divisibility of 8. Long story short, all right, um, here are those constants I was telling you about. 4.70156, uh, on and on and on, and a minus 1.701, so on and so on. All right, these are the points, remember I said, between 1 fifth and 1 fourth. At one, it's 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 not equal to it's it's less than another one. It's equal all the way from one fifth as it gets smaller. The actual dividing line is one divided by four point seven zero one five nine. So it's at that point everything becomes equal. All right, anything smaller becomes equal. On on the other side of zero, um, it, at that point it, there's an uncertainty in that region as well, but it's, a, it's it begins at a different value, and that is the inverse of a minus one point seven or minus 1 divided by 1.701. Okay, so these are the points where that uncertainty is, is now, it's equal. It's where it was greater than or less than, it is now equal to all the way to infinity, the opposite direction. So those values become important. Fortunately, for all real-world processes, there's always a place where it can fit in where it will be certain. And we will show even to describe um, the original uncertainty relation with the uh, conservation of energy and they work with us in a second. Okay, so yes, there are all two possible solutions for all uh, arguments um, of the uh, sigma, with the exception of having argue, applying arguments chi to minus 8. In that case, because quadratic shows all, has two answers for everyone, it is not applicable. What you'll get is negative infinity, and the other one is indeterminate. So, but the answer is one third. There is another way to use the solution other than a quadratic. Um, but yes, it's very easy to see that this will be. All right, long story short, let's move on. Okay. Um, now, how is all this applied? It, it comes from, from this neat little theorem, which is pretty much allowing us to connect certainty to approximation. Um, and uh, so suppose f is a continuous complex value function. Um, I guess uh, Bill Luke is on here. He might like this one because it's saying everything is continuous. Um, but I just threw that in there. All right. Defined on the real integral a and b for every error or approximation greater than zero, there exists a polynomial function p over the complex such that for all x in a and b, we have, guess what? There's That is right there defining the the less than or greater than absolute, the greater than or less than absolute, I'm sorry. 
the less than aspect of the uncertainty relation. If you look at it that way, you can see this is describing everything in that area. Or equivalently, you get this relationship. If f is real valued, the polynomial function be taken over the reals, which is why you get the real part of, of, of that oscillation. Okay, so let's let's go. This is how it's all we're, we're this is all applicable to this uh, um, to these definitions. Oh, and this is a meaningless side note to show try to get you all to have some fun with this because there is there is some because there is two there are two solutions two solutions from this polynomial, we can get two H's. And we can apply different values in different places. For instance, these are the values that I'll put to minus phi. Um, and so you can you can get irrational results from, well, it's a square root, so of course you can. But anyway, I just thought I'd throw that in there, trying to, to see, because anyone interested in Fibonacci numbers and that can go use this. I mean, there's no end to where you can you know do with this. We're going to now apply it to probabilities. All right. Our probability oscillation is bounded by 0 and 1 for positive arguments s. Actually, we, we discussed. So we express them as an assignment of probabilities. Let our function be a, a, a random variable with a mean value uh, mu, mu, and uh, um, we get this is the we can apply this as energy is typically denoted energy, and uh, um, is equal to the the mean value, and here the operator e is the average or expected value of the oscillation then the standard deviation of the oscillation is the quantity uh, sigma. Okay, what do we got? This is the same thing that our, our, our Russian friends came up with in their paper. It is, this is how they used, this is how they applied it. And you see where um, the function I'm talking about fits in there. This is where it is. This is how it's used as probabilities. So you can then carry that on to provide meaningful results. You saw the... Um, was it Hamil yeah. the Hamiltonian? It was the, uh, um, I don't remember the exact way it was symbolized, but I think delta H. That would be equivalent to sigma here. That is how he got that value. Okay? And so you see where my function is, is in there. That is, that is what it means. That's where, how you use it. All right. So when you get this, uh, um, this um, deviation, standard deviation, when he was using it, he called it the standard energy. Well, that's what it means. It's the standard standard energy or standard deviation. Um, it, when it becomes a sawtooth, the absolute value of a sawtooth, um, then it contains all of even and odd harmonics of the function, which denotes balance, and it's, it's, it's a very important part of my paper. Uh, well, very interesting aspect of the paper. Um, it's only a side note in the paper, but uh, um, a very interesting uh, part of it because it describes, with a, with a sawtooth wave, Anything where you can describe all the even and odd harmonics of a function, you can take that function and describe other functions with it. And so this is the fundamental aspect of, of this, uh, of my paper, um, with real part being one half. But since the proof doesn't rely on it, I make it as a side note. Anyway, um, this follows from the single occurrence. This is the only time we're going to get the real part of this to be equal to a function is when that real part equals one half and zero. So the rest of it follows from that equivalence. All right. In any case, that's how we got the probabilities. All right, so I like to make a couple statements based on what we're about to see. Um, I say that uncertainty arises from not knowing both arguments. Um, we don't know what went in, we just know the remainder coming out. We can't know what caused this and what was joined with this to create this uh, um, remainder. So that's where the uncertainty relations come from. Now, I don't know if others have expressed it this way, but I'll show you why. I mean, we can't solve for chi, the, the, chi, the value of zero called the chi function, um, for any, any more, without knowing, you know, um, we can't solve from it. Sorry, I was later that night doing this. I don't even know what. <laughs> One cannot solve from chi function for any more than. Oh, okay. We can't solve for the values that are smaller, you know, outside of this uh, uncertainty relation. Okay. Any more, and the reason we can't is because we would we wouldn't be able to know what x is if we know y and z and x mod y equals z. We, you just you can't you can't go that way mathematically, um, and you just you can't know 
um, any all certain relations come from indeterminate solutions. So if you have this solution, it's like you can go one way, but you can't come back the other. So in other ways, it's a way of looking and saying, I can, I can do this, and you don't know how I got there. It, it could be applicable to uh, encryption if you want to study it that way. Um, it kind of mathematically, you know, makes a statement equivalent to saying the perfect secret is possible um, because something can be put that way, and never you'll never know how you got it out of it. And that comes mathematically um, from this process, which I have linked the modular aspect of it to the, the uncertainty relation. And so you see why these things are arising. It's just why we can't go to you can say, well, we can't know <coughs> we can't know the position of the electron at the same time we measure the momentum because we don't have both arguments. We don't know the arguments that went there. However, if you are that electron, you might very well know. I went there this way because I was pushed off that. But outside, you know, we're looking at the set, we can't know what the color the marbles are on the inside because it's just mathematically they don't they don't jive in certain regions of the function. All right, so let's let's apply it. How much time have we got? Okay. All right. This will be the last of the math. Thank God. Jeff, uh, we're at 1030 right now. <clears throat> so, uh, I mean, you can finish. Uh, typically, we'd, we'd want to be close to being done right now, so we got half an hour for questions. But, you know, if you, you can take another 10 minutes to finish up if that's where you're at. Yeah. Um, okay. All right, I'm going to finish up. Basically, in nine steps, this is how you would find, you would define this uncertainty. I can show by, by finding this value, I can find the next. I'm just going to sum it up. Um, you can find every aspect of the function, and this is how you do it. Basically, in this point, because I got something really interesting I want to show you, so I'm not going to not going to spend too much time on this. And uh, but let me say, this is these are the steps here to determine the uh, um, why this is uncertain in those regions. All right, how do you solve it? So um, you can replay this video and freeze frame it on this and then read every aspect of it. But you will see you will see that this is the steps you can do is to apply every aspect of the tool. Determine the period, go on and so forth. Okay, I will just give you the results of doing that for this un specific uncertainty relation. And, and you get that, you get angular momentum in the function, it becomes equal to Planck's constant at that point. So it seems that angular momentum is arriving to be equal to Planck's constant. Then when you have then you have at that point for the rest of the function, you have Planck's constant over two is equal to this relationship. It, sh it suggests to me, the Planck's constant is just a value and doesn't have fundamental meaning until one condition is met. When the momentum, when the momentum, um, all it says mathematically, and my interpretation may be different to you, but what I say is, is that angular momentum of light, and yes, you can express it in terms of angular momentum because there is relativistic mass, and um, when theta, this function, is equal to pi divided by two, and then two phases must be present that one is equal to half of the other. I'm going to show you this really quick. It's very neat. I don't want to waste any time because I want to show the results. All right. Um, let me quick read. Thus, the energy of the system is always greater when the angular momentum is continuously changing. That's a new way of looking at it, but that's exactly what that doing that will show. Thus, in all stable systems, the atom, for instance, energy is conserved as the system is in its relaxed state. By creating a system where the input consists of a changing frequency alone and not the energy, the angular momentum can be put in a state of continuous change, demanding additional energy from the out, outside of the set. All right, I'm going to go and show you a couple of examples how to do it. This is, I'm not going to show this video. We don't have time. Um, this is a way of creating, I did an experiment. Um, it, it, all I'm doing is talking anyway, of how to fine tune the distance on there to change the angle of the magnet spin. The magnet video we saw before did 12 coils, all with specific measurements, which are up here. You can't see it, but just note that I have it. Everything is very carefully controlled. And then I changed the input oscillation of frequency to affect the precession, which is how fast the magnet would flip over. And then I changed the duty cycle to change the phase of the wave. And then you can see, you can take these equation, equations and uh, um, 
and then you, you calculate your angular frequency and you apply it. And sure enough, out of 600 different variations, the only time that object would become a standing self sustained system, standing wave that would go around in all four motion is when theta at this angle between the velocity, the vector, is at 90 degrees, pi divided by 2. And if you take this uh, um, the magnet, you have one angle, which is was the phase here, it, where it's, it's tilted upward, and then another angle on a different axis, or axis um, at half of that angle, at that sweet spot, it is always going to create that, um, that sort of standing wave. Same thing for light. It does the same exact thing. That is how a system becomes stable, and that is how energy is conserved. When those conditions are met, I call it the specific trajectory hypothesis. The experiment supports it. The math that I showed earlier, which I didn't have time to get into, um, it, it supports it. The uh, um, And now let's just see what who else is using it. All right, Searle, John Searle. I'm gonna I'll make this quick, but it shouldn't be. It's so cool. All right. When I have met him, I had a hard, find it hard time talking with him. The accent's thick. I I much prefer talk with his, some people working with him. But who is John Searle? He's a guy in uh, he was like I think it's in the 80s. When he was 14, he came up with some idea for a perpetual motion machine, which today anyone laughs at. He had found some guys that believed in it. And he went to work on it, and uh, as legend has it, he he made it work. He Jeff, is, it was actually in the 50s and 60s, and even in the 40s. That's yeah, it's been a long time. A long time ago. And, uh, um, and <clears throat> he describes well, why has it so, been so difficult? He's now making reproductions. He's got some people helping him. Why was it so difficult from that time to now to make this? And he said, largely because the price of neodymium has gone up. It used to be something, you, I mean, you get at a gas station or something. It was very, very affordable. And now the price of it has gone up. And, and so, at least in the 80s, it's now it's a little bit cheaper. We were talking about China buying it all out. It's a little cheaper now, so it's just more affordable. So the, they are experimenting again on it. Um, it yeah, it a, it's a, would be considered a perpetual motion machine of the second kind. The first kind would be one that's impossible. It's violating uh, um, laws of thermodynamics. But I wanted to describe how... The confusion around people when they kind of go to his work, why they get lost. All right, let's just read one paragraph. It's it's valid, but let's just read one paragraph. All right, the SEG configuration of rollers in motion cuts through the magnetic flux with a unique cycloid pattern that is superimposed over an orbit around the circumference of the stator. In this manner, each roller can also induce eddy currents of mutual induction between the copper surfaces to form a frictionless magnet bearing as it generates radial electrical potentials. Most people, especially those skeptical of any of his claims, will read this and say, this is complete nonsense. And, and uh, of course, the guy is crazy. But I understand what that means. I know exactly what that means. I will show you. Let's see if I can get this here. Okay, here we have an aluminum. Find the camera. Uh, it's a power um, source of a computer, right? It's it's not aluminum. It's steel. All right. We got a magnet. All right, and I just put it so it's it's thick enough so it doesn't flip over easy. And magnet feels. Does everyone see this? If not, well, sorry. All right, let me move back. All right. As it comes to a bend, it's resistive of it, right? And additionally, when I want to push it. It doesn't really want to roll. It wants to stay in that spot. That is the, the magnetic flux he's saying it cuts through. All right, now eddy currents. I want to show you something before you go. Eddy currents. Oh, where's my magnet? Here it is. Eddy currents most of us know about, right? When, when you, you've seen this. Where's my cancer here? You take a magnet and you drop it through a, a copper tube or a brass. It slows it down. You see it fell out slower than it's supposed to. That's because it's inducing eddy currents in the uh, um, direction of the poles, all right? Well, what he's doing is he's, he's sending them this way, and it causes an acceleration. Oh, can you prove that? Sure I can, in about two seconds. You take this, and you just let it, bring it to the edge. I got a little piece of plastic, I'll show you in a second, and you let go. Now remember, it's hard to push this thing over the over the 
the bend anyway, because it resists the bend. But if I get it in the right spot at the right trajectory, it made a, oh, it's not even in the camera. Hold on. Back up. Hard to see the camera. All right. There we go. I can make it over that bend if I can get it my angle right. There we go. It accelerates it because it's pushing the eddy currents out of the way. It's push. It's it's like I say. It's it's changing the flux of the of the the steel inside of it. So it actually accelerates it, and when it accelerates it. Then it's freer to move, or it, freer to move in the exact opposite as um, a magnet is falling through a copper tube. This is just where's my camera? A uh, plastic lens from a magnifying glass, and uh, um, it is this angle. I'm working on it, Jeff. Okay, thank you. I don't know if I can get a good shot here. There. Uh, okay, I can't figure out who's where that sound is coming from. Somebody's bringing some background noise. By the way, everyone else is watching. All right, you see on my screen, I put it off, and it's going to come down that angle as it approaches the steel. And as it does, it's, it's accelerating at just such a ratio that it can induce acceleration all the way across the steel. It's from me. See, that's how it works. Just that is from me. Yeah, all right. Who said that? I can't figure it out. Darn it. I don't know. Somebody got quiet all of a sudden. All right. Very okay. good. Another. Hi. There's nobody left to mute. Everybody's muted. It's weird. Um. <laughs> Sorry, Jeff. It's all right. It's all right. Oh, well, let me get to the point. All right. <clears throat> Another aspect of it is mag magnetic gears. It's another thing that Searle talks about. I know what magnetic gears are, too. Uh, I can't do that. Uh, I'm so sorry. I don't know who it is. Everybody's muted. Charlie somebody is, just came in and is making some noise and isn't somebody, even aware of it. It's somebody on a phone. No. Yeah, it's... <sighs> okay, it stopped. I don't know who did it, but it's now. Oh. Darn. Well, that's okay. I can compete. All right. <laughs> you will survive. I don't mind competition. All right. Now, what I did, now he, he also, Cyril, talks about uh, um, uh, magnetic gears. I know about magnetic gears, too. You take the magnet and you put it at an angle and you put it at another angle. Sorry. Just before. And then you. Oh. And then you put it in a, a case to hold the magnet at that specific angle, and I can create a magnetic gear too, without AC magnetization. Let's find the camera. All right. Let's see. What is a magnetic gear? That's a magnetic gear. Now I can turn it around, flip the other side, and I can make it go up. That's a magnetic gear. It's, it has to do with the way he magnetized the, um, the, the magnets themselves. It, it has some spiral twisting aspect of it that has a gradient. So I went and I uh, tried to apply some of this to see if I could reproduce some of uh, Tom Ballone. He has at his lab some experiments based on patents from Asia and that. Where you basically have, where's the camera? Magnets arranged in a certain way. This is off a 3D printer. I got another one arriving today with more precision, the precision of this screen. But basically, it's just a test to see how far we can get this magnet to go around. Let's see. The only problem is you, my magnet's falling out of the top, and you have to hold it still. The one I have ordered. All right, so once you get past this point, it goes almost all the way around. So much that it should it should be able to um, 
it should be able to, with a tiny motor using uh, inductors, give it some extra energy. I was always like, I don't really like that. Tom Tom Ballone's really big into it um, because it's it's definitely a, de a definitely way to make a very efficient motor ready and available today. But you still got this little hump to get over, right? So what is missing in this is this is a two-dimensional layout. It's the motion it's taking is just going in a circle. You need that precession to get over the hump. So you take this configuration, which is based on the distances that I use with this little uh, lens, and then you put it at those angles. And this is what I have coming, but it hasn't arrived today, so I won't be able to show. I doubt it works, but you never know. And uh, um, the theory is, will it get over? I got it already to be 100% around, but making another uh, across that hump. Like I said, I can do it with metal. There's, it is possible to get past the hump, but the point is, you got to have the right angle, and that right, so that condition is met, and then it does go. And and Searle does appear to have it. Um, so, let me just go and, and conclude this and see, because I'm sure there's gonna be some questions. We only got about a short time for questions. All right. In line with the de Broglie hypothesis, that all objects are waves. And dictating that all objects are continuously in motion with respect to, to each other, the specific trajectory hypothesis di dictates by consequence that the object can be at only one trajectory at any given moment of time. Well, that's not very important, except that it leads to the next part. It is always determined by the path of least action, and it is done instantly. Therefore, if I have a ball, now I'm just going to perfect sphere on top of another perfect sphere, right? It is going to fall over. It is always going to fall over. But how is that determined that this path has least action and this least action to do it instantly? It is because it is not a component of time itself. It has to do with more of a, um, that's where the uncertain relations arise. It must ignore all other conditions in order to find it, this aspect instantly. Um, what I'm saying is basically then you need motion. If you have a ball bouncing on top of another ball, you have to kind of go back and forth to get it to stand on. If you have a magnet you want to levitate over a certain thing, you have to have it moving or you have to be balancing it. So that is that is all it says. Um, but the, the aspect is, is that it is determined by nature to infinity instantly. And the way it can do this is in terms of, let's say it has a fast calculator, or it does it because it works in terms of moments. It doesn't work in a linear clock like we do. It is determined instantly and it's not by chance. Any cyclical system, the circle group, like an atom and, and uh, electrodynamics, all of the circle group, uh, not electrodynamics, um, the electromagnetic fields, uh, that's aspect, the electric field, these are the circle groups. They cannot resonate with another cyclical, cyclical system without external in influence, just as a perfect sphere cannot be balanced on another perfect sphere without motion. In this sense, the systemic balance of uncertainty relations does not seem to account for the finer precision of nature at the infinitesimally small or large points near infinity or zero. Conservation of natural processes occurs in hard limits as opposed to gradient convergence, of which those hard limits are determined by resonance with the set and not the elements themselves. Oh, a couple last there. Um, let me just read them. I don't know. How, all right. Physical constants, H, C, may be more accurately considered the hard limit values of conserved processes as opposed to fundamental definitions of nature. Energy cannot in all cases be determined by constants as constants are determined by space or time. Nature determines least action more accurately outside of time or space by instantly known mathematical potentials. It's a matter of determining is it greater than or less than? Oh, it's less than? Then I will go that direction. It's that simple. Energy is conserved by hard limits of cyclical systems in time and space. Nature, however, is not cyclical nor bounded by such limits, as nature is able to make instant determinations of greater than or less than potentials independently of time or space. Since all systems share consequences of nature on a whole, the balancing of a ball requires external motion. A system is not an island in that it could exist on its own without affect of another. All energetic systems are dependent on the more fundamental nature of the universe whose energy is not conserved. The law of conservation of energy states that the total energy of an isolated system cannot change it is said to be conserved over time. Long story short, the uh, thermodynamics denotes that a perpetual motion machine of the first kind cannot exist because it is an isolated system. This says isolated systems don't exist.
and that's the general thing. So it, it really doesn't matter to us. And uh, thank you. I believe that's all. I hope so, because it was longer than I expected. I apologize. But thank you. That's it. You can read these as you go, but definitely take questions. Okay. Well, thank yeah. you, Jeff. I'm going to go ahead. I have so many comments, that, uh, but I'm gonna, <clears throat> I won't uh, take a lot of your time to, to say them, but um, you touched on an awful lot of things. And um, I, I think the uncertainty thing, uh, the, I, I wrote down what you said, uncertainty comes from not knowing both arguments. Um, certainly looking into complex numbers could handle some of what we think of as uncertainty, but a part of it, it just has to do with the quadratic nature of re interactions. And so there's always going to be basically, you know, in one sense, the uncertainty relation says that the cosine is less than one. But if we take into account complex numbers, then of course you can get a, a cosine becomes a, a hyperbolic cosine, which can be greater than one. <laughs> so we can, so maybe in a, in a way that's really a, the uncertainty relation becomes something when we add c complex numbers, we can we can take that out. So um, it's an interesting way of saying it the way you put it. The other thing that I just wanted to quickly comment on <clears throat> was uh, I really love that slide six, and I won't make you go back there, but it had this idea that addition, or uh, excuse me, multiplication and division, obviously, too, was really just a scaling. And so I thought, well, uh, addition is just a translation. I mean, that's really all it is. So I thought, well, what about reflection and rotation? Well, rotation is also a multiplication, but it's a multiplication by a complex number. And reflection is a, is a multiplication by a negative number. So really, we have uh, all the possibilities. In other words, they can all be thought of as transformations in that way. Uh, I'm talking about what I'm saying. Yeah, he said that. My point was that one has to do with the transformation of the set as opposed to right, the element. Right, right. And all I was doing was looking at uh, what are the, you know, the, the basic physical transformations, tra the translation, scale, reflection, and rotation, and they, they can all be thought of in that same way, some sort of, you know, it related to the idea of multiplication or addition. Anyway, just thought I'd share that with you. That was, a, that was an aha experience for me. Uh, okay, Glenn Baxter, I believe, was first, and then Bill Lucas, and then Pal Asija. So, uh, Glenn, go ahead, you're first. I don't have my camera working. That's other, it's not that I don't want to be seen. It just isn't working today. It looks like Glenn's oh. isn't either. OK. Um, I really enjoy watching and listening to you present. I really do. Really. Uh, I have a question. Uh, many times you talk about the real part. And I'm wondering, well, how does he know, you know that the non-real part is not relevant here? And is there some kind of general? Um, idea for non-mathematicians uh, at your level to to know when uh, you know when you, when people using the real and not the unreal is the unreal part somehow extraneous or what's going on there? Ah, uh, well, there's nothing really more more real or unreal about the real part or uh, an imaginary part um, any more than the number five. You know, you can trip over, right? It's, they're all imaginary, but what is, is the difference is is that we are describing this component based on this variable and this component on this variable, then we have to account that we can't intermix them. So to do a, a, through complex arithmetic, multiplying um, a, a complex or a, a real number times an imaginary number gives an imaginary number, just like a times you know two a times b equals two ab, but how you would look at them, you can look at all numbers, real or imaginary, as the points on, a, on the complex plane. So if the complex plane has this graph, it's not a number line like, like we typically look at numbers, it's a graph, like a plane, like you know, two-dimensional space. Even a real number has a place on there. Imaginary number has a place on there. A complex with both a real and number has a place on there. So there's really no difference, but the important thing with following through this equation is that you have to use the function so that it, it makes sense. So applying an imaginary part there is going to have different mathematical consequences. I don't know if that answers your question. Well, well, like for um, an NP is expressed by electrical engineers um, using quant complex arithmetic, where there's a real part and an imaginary, but the impedance is very, very, very real. Yes. Um, so. You're going to have to turn your. Are you using? Closer, uh, yeah. Are you are you using uh, 
a different sense than an electrical engineer does when he's talking about a, a complex impedance which has a real and imaginary part? No, it's the same thing. A complex, uh, when you have an imaginary part and a, um, a real part, that is a, that makes a complex number. But a real number is the same thing as a complex number. It's just that it's imaginary number equals zero. So it's it, you got to understand there there's no real difference. It's just that one has different meaning. For instance, reactive power is the imaginary property of power uh, vector. Reactive power is that power coming back to the source. So if you have AC, it's kind of there's some power going this way, some going this way. You want so you measure what comes to the the motor that you want to test efficiency, you want to make sure it's real power, what we call real power, is higher. If it's imaginary power is higher, higher, your motor may not even turn it. So they still have real physical meanings. It's just a different way of measuring. So it's the same thing. They all have physical okay. meanings. Okay, very good. That clears it up. Uh, second, about that China has bought all of it up. Uh, could you spell that? On what, what was that again? Neodymium? The, the yeah, metal, how do you spell it? that? I'll, I'll type it in the uh, um, chat. Oh, molybdenum? Uh, uh, one of the elements. Uh, Alex, oh, Neo, are, uh, type Alex it guy, in. you're bad, one Alex. The, <laughs> yeah. Is that one of the elements? I never, never saw that. Is that one of our elements? It, yeah, no, it's, it's not an element. It's melanthonides. It's in the rare, rare earth group, even though it's not rare. All right. Okay, yeah, that's my question. It. It's nice an alloy. Job, is yeah, it not? But, it's not an element. Neodymium is an element. Nine, Oh, you're right. It is an element. Nice. Pardon me. Nice job. Yeah, is. You now bring, the magnets that you bring now, a lot listen, of. Hold on, hold on. The magnets that they make are are are, are an alloy. There's neodymium, iron, and boron, but they just call them neodymium magnets because they don't have any other. You know, it's too much. So um, you're gonna get uh, there's some also some other trace elements in there. So the magnet itself, these magnets are an alloy, but what is uh, the way they define it is the first element is neodymium, but it's got a lot of iron in it too. All right. Okay, Jeff. Uh, Jeff, job. You really make uh, math exciting and interesting. Uh, really thank great you. job. I enjoyed it immensely. Thank you very much. Okay, that's okay, Dr. Lucas. You're next, and then Pal. Um, Jeff. I was yeah, very right. interested in your comments about uh, uh, the uncertainty principle and Planck's constant. And uh, I think you might be aware of some of my work and that of Dave Bergman. We have uh, uh, made a physical model for the electron, and uh, which consists of a continuous uh, loop of charge. And it has... Uh, Besides forming a circle uh, around this toroidal ring, it also has a cross-sectional uh, rotation. And the electric and magnetic forces uh, for stability, when they're in balance, uh, you get a condition that enables you to predict Planck's constant, H. And so um, does your work give any uh, notions as to what the, your work is would say about the motion of the charges in these uh, uh, two uh, periodic motions that we uh, appear to find in the electron structure. Does it say uh, there's uh, uncertainty or vibrations or something like that in that structure that it's not uh, really um, constant? Yeah, um, well, thanks. thank you. I understand your question. Um, yes, I do know your work. The first thing you understand is that you're talking about a charge not moving linearly, so you do have trajectory involved, and you do have a frequency, how many times it goes around and around and around. So you do have that process, uh, aspect. So therefore, you can take that, and you can calculate the angular momentum from its path. If you calculate its angular momentum, I don't know if you have done that, but if you go back and do that, you may... It, Calculate the angular momentum. If, if it's, if it's, you know, your your math is all right with it, you will see that the angular momentum will meet up with the value of Planck's constant. If you're talking about, um, you know, these these processes, if you're, so for instance, I can take the angular momentum and I can, you know, 
you get the phase and you get all make sure all these param parameters are, are accounted for you will see that angular momentum kind of converges with Planck's constant well it looks like it's converging but then it's equal to from all other other uh, um it's like it's like less than it's less than Planck's constant so basically what it's saying is that at very high frequencies then somehow that angle it's like if you send a uh, um a satellite or a moon towards the earth all right and it's hitting just right at the right angle if it's going too fast or going too slow if it's going too slow it's going to crash to the earth if it's going too fast at the right angle it's going to skip by the earth so it's a matter of getting the angle and the uh, timing or the velocity um in sync and if that case then the angular velocity just like the moon you can calculate the angular velocity that angular velocity is constant it is, it is unless of course it's more elliptical but in a quantum process, there's not other, these other fields may affect it. I don't know exactly your math, or, you know, with, with, with the Torah, right? I haven't done it with that. But I can say that if there is some aspect, these, these points where, um, where Planck's constant meets up, then I, I believe that you're going to see that it meets up with angular momentum in those areas, or in the opposite, every other spot other than that it meets up. It depends on how you the equation. But I do believe it's the same process, and I, I don't, I don't see much difference between it and angular momentum. I'm not saying that they're not different. I mean, obviously it's a constant, but I see Planck's constant as more as a limit of how much light can do within uh, at the speed of light. We got so, some echo here. Yeah, where is it? Let me turn on the mic. Sorry, I cannot oh. figure out who it is. I don't know, Bill. Does that answer your question at all? Um, yeah, it's 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 on there. I have one other question um, uh, I have been looking recently in uh, some of the textbooks for electrodynamics and one of the fundamental problems that has never been solved is why is the amount of charge in the electron or the proton or any other charged particle why is it quantized why is it always the same value everywhere uh, I think there's one or two elementary particles that have a charge of two but it's quantized. It's either one or two units of that. Is there any, I know you were trying to uh, determine some unique values of things in what you were doing. Is there any thing there that would uh, give us a hint as to what would cause the amount of charge, say, in an electron to be a particular value? Yeah, that would also would be a hard limit of how it would hold its structure. So you got to understand what it would be first that is forming the electron, which forms the set. And then once you understand what that is, then you take those, I don't know, there's a lot of particle physicists that are better equipped to answer what it is that creates an electron. But you, you find out what those two arguments were. And when that condition is met, that frequency can only be that way. The electron weight, the size, that is the smallest area that it can fit into with that amount of energy of whatever it is that took it. So if you would look back to, way back to the equations earlier, um, we're talking about uh, fitting things into the smallest, you know, field that it can be in. If you have this amount and this amount of something or other, and you want to put it in a container, there's only so small you can compact that. And there's only so large it can be too. So it, otherwise it just breaks apart. If it meets that condition, that specific trajectory, then it will be a self-sustaining system, and it can't be any other than that big or that small, having that mass, unless you do something else to it externally, like you move the electron. Then it can have a little bit more uh, relativistic mass, but uh, that's that's the reason. It's because those two arguments, we can't look at electron and determine um, what it is that it has been comprised of, because the way we define things usually comes from electron. We have to go and figure out, like a lot of people believe maybe it's like a, a muon or a tachyon created electron. Um, some people believe, I would say a lot of people, some people believe that. And so if you study that, so what's the math on a muon, what's the math on the tachyon, and then you can go ahead and see how they could come together, then you might understand why they're there at that size. But you would have to first know what creates an electron before you can go and determine that. Okay, thank answer. you very much. You. <laughs> okay, pal, and then Ed Doughty. We're not hearing you, pal. You need to unmute yourself. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, a small technicality, isn't it? Anyway, I did it. Um, 
great presentation, Jeff. A uh, little bit over my head, but great. Um, who or what, in uh, your opinion, might be causing and controlling this uncertainty? And uh, if it is something uh, reliable, I mean, always there, can it be convert commercialized um, or bottled like this? Uh, <laughs> like the people who sell and others who try to commercialize uh, free energy <laughs> or the fl quantum fluctuation or whatever. Okay. I don't See, I want to get behind them. I mean, who is doing it or what is doing it? What do you mean? What is the source of uncertainty? Ah, well, I'll tell you one thing. Things wouldn't hold together if we, <laughs> we didn't have it because it would take time for nature to determine which direction to go. So it must have some cases where it has to ignore the other. I can show a demonstration. I'll just kind of talk about it. If I have a magnet here and a magnet here, and I have um, a, a steel ball in the middle, well, the, the steel ball doesn't pull on both magnetic fields. It chooses which is closer, and that's the potential it takes. Otherwise, if things didn't operate that way, then nothing would hold together. So physically, it has to, mathematically, it works that way. And physically, it would have to work that Things just simply wouldn't bond. They would always be torn between two choices. The fact that it has to know, nature instantly knows whether that nature is, a, I don't know, a computer program put on by God, whatever you want to say it, somehow it functions because it has to choose one or another direction now. It can't think about it, and it knows that answer at affinity, and it can do that affinity because we can do it mathematically affinity by t taking in terms of its moment there. So I can calculate this um, with this function. I can sit there and look from infinity and work backwards. I, we are typically used to working in time goes this way. And it's converging and we get out to billions of numbers. No, this way you actually could look at it from infinity and go, oh, I know what that value is right now. I'm not going that direction. So mathematically, it works very easy. And uh, um, nature would, of course, choose the easier way, and the path of least action, it, it has to happen at, at, at any moment, just like a ball, you know, falling off of another ball. It knows where it is without having to calculate the time, hey, this force is greater than the other. And um, so who is doing it? Um, I believe it's just, it's like saying who who's, you know, pulling this magnet to the other magnet. It's just a process of nature. So you mentioned, did you mention uh, Tom Vallone? And I was wondering if this has any nexus to cold fusion? Tom Vallone's interested in uh, um, zero-point energy, cold fusion, and a couple different uh, aspects. I have done a little bit of experimentation in plasma, but uh, um, I don't know what he's doing with cold fusion. I think he looks in a range of uh, the subjects. So. But, yeah, I mean, it, this, this, what I'm talking about here would apply to, you know, not only number theory, you would apply to physics, I mean, you could apply it to game theory. It, it's going to have a, a lot of tie-ins. It's just, there's, to my knowledge, no one even going into, I know there's some people looking at the, the functions that I presented, but when you see that you can start to look at, use it as a tool to get what the answers you want, then it makes you want to go and, and learn it, um, I would hope. But it's not that complicated. Once, once you go through one time, Working with the function, you're going to know it, and, and it's very easy to work with. And then, it, but it explains a lot. Like I, I talk about these points at affinity until you go mathematically and you, and you ex examine it. Um, and you, and I talk about it in the paper, but until you go and play with the, the equations, you don't know what. You, there's no way to know what I'm talking about. It's just impossible. But I can tell you, it's really neat, and you should look into it. But other than that, um, yeah, cold fusion. I don't know. All right, what's your, what's your question? Other question? Anything else? Uh my question was more specific than that as to what is the relationship between cold fusion and uncertainty? Okay, I, I didn't really tap on cold fusion, so I don't okay. know. All right. I know other people are waiting, so I have taken enough time. Thank you very much, okay, Jeff. Thanks. Okay, Ed, thanks. you're next. And then Dr. Ian Cowan is after that. Uh, 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 Jeff, very good presentation, man. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can yep. hear you good. Very good. Very good presentation. And uh, Jeff, what you, you did a very good presentation. I thought I even learned something myself. But you, you touched on 
the realities of the measurement. And when we step in the laboratory, the, the uncertainty that comes about uh, as an experimental physicist, I can tell you that, uh, in answering the question uh, that was previously asked about the uncertainty. And when we make measurements with instruments, we can only detect certain things, and it is the detector that brings about the uncertainty. And what, what these theories are actually point out, the mathematics, and I, and I agree with, um, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the talk, the spe specific talk, what, uh, what, uh, what, uh, what was talked about when uh, when um, said the moderator was saying, I think you you were saying that uh, just a minute ago that the uncertainty is the reality, and without that we could we could make a measurement, we could make a decision. We have to make decisions on what we have. The instruments are not perfect, and and what you pointed out. And uh, uh, Jeff, I want to get your opinion on that. I don't know if you saw that. Uh, YouTube on the Russian experiment aboard the Russian spacecraft. And you talked about momentum and the conservation of momentum and so forth. And uh, you did you did see that, did Jeff? Did you? No, I'm sorry, I didn't see that. Okay, you might want to click on there and watch it again. Um, yeah. And, uh, and, and, and Dave, folks, you saw, you saw it, right? I saw it, yes. Yeah, right. And what I noticed when the Russians had, had they had this long threaded shaft and they had this thumb note, it's this thumb boat, right? And you're in a, a weightless uh, space cabin and um, the space cabin was filled with probably one atmosphere or a fraction of an atmosphere, uh, not in a vacuum, but it's in the spacecraft, it's in orbit about the Earth. It's, it's probably a near Earth orbit. And what they did, they spun this uh, uh, this this uh, thumb boat and spun it on the shaft, right? And when it when it's spun around on the shaft, the, the the boat is spinning, right? And when it left the shaft, right, the camera was on the side of the of the uh, the shaft facing the astronaut that spun the the boat up. And when this boat left the shaft, if the boat was still spinning. And the the pointed side of the boat was pointing towards the 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 the, the threaded shaft and the camera, and it appears to be spinning in the clockwise direction. And it spun like that for a couple of seconds, went about a meter down, you know, away from the shaft. Seemed seemed to be spinning constantly in a weightless environment. And all of a sudden, something started happening, and I have a colleague of mine who, uh, who is Russian, who I worked with at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. He, he, he told me just of what, what these Russians were talking about. It was, they were, they were discussing this thing in Russian. And my Russian is not, you know, I don't, I don't have fluent Russian, but they did mention something about air turbulence. All of a sudden, oh, wow. this, uh, air turbulence, you know, something about turbulence, right? Okay. I don't know what these Russians had inside the space cabin a magnetic field turned on to protect themselves from cosmic radiation or what, whether there's some other kind of disturbance in the spacecraft or whatever it was, the Russians didn't, didn't mention it, but they did mention something about turbulence. This, this boat kept spinning, right, very smoothly, clockwise direction, nothing disturbing it, and also about a meter away, something strange started happening. This thing started, you know, flipping around as if something perturbed it and you didn't mention in your presentation, you mentioned something about um, uh, you have, um, you, you, when something is spun up like a gyroscope, it, it, has, it processes if you apply a torque to it. Something applied a torque to this thing, I don't know whether this is a valid experiment or what, but all of a sudden it spun around, it started, you know, it made a 180 degree flip and you're not looking at the, 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 the back of the, the boat. Now you're looking at the other side of the boat. For example, you're looking at the earth from the North Pole and you see the earth and you notice the earth is spinning counterclockwise. If you, you take the spacecraft and you fly around to the South Pole, look up at the earth, the earth is spinning clockwise. So what, I, what I noticed in this, in this, in this film that the Russians had on YouTube, the boat continued to spin in the clockwise direction. That's something, something wrong about that because however, 
conservation of momentum and three inputs with the journalists call it. That that's a violation. And and I agree with one of the, one of the other uh guys who mentioned on on the NPA that it was about the the the, 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 the of of uh, something about this 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 experiment that was fake. Whether the Russians were playing games or what, I don't know. But I'm gonna be quiet here and listen to your comment. Do you think they believe it's real? I mean, did, when you saw it, did it look real? Looks like it could have been, you know, real. But uh, you know, that that thing of uh, you know, is angular momentum conserved? It certainly doesn't look like it. So it won't, it won't be. It, it's going to have the same problem with the uh, conservation of energy at certain points. Now you got to understand, momentum is an equation you can derive from mass. So if you're in a, um, a lack of a gravitational field, you may see those limits, just like you will see those or those uncertainties where it's no longer being conserved just like you do with energy at very high frequencies so the the equation is going to be this exactly the same as the uh, conservation of energy <clears throat> so you get outside the gravitational field and that would be a great place to test the conservation of momentum it has exactly the, the type of conditions where you would want to test it i don't know i did want to say i didn't see the video but i do want to say one um one thing i'm not saying that uncertainty is a real thing. I'm saying it was caused by something, but you may not be able to get that information. Like I can, it, you know, it's like it's like the you know the tree fall in the woods doesn't make a sound, right? Well, what I'm saying is it did make a sound, but you have no way of knowing. And that's right. all I'm saying. You see, so it really did happen. It really was certain and determined. It fell from the force of gravity. It made a sound in the sound vibrations and the speed of sound. But you have no way of mathematically computing that. And that's all I'm saying. I'm saying it was there. It was, there was something that determined its cause. But there's no way to get there because you're only studying the remainder. Just like with the modular function. It's just pulling out the remainder. So you can't mathematically go the other way and find out what brought that remainder. It's called indeterminate. There's an infinite number of possibilities that could have been. But one thing what I'm saying is you definitely can prove that it, that tree made a sound by reproducing it from deliberately causing that consequence and say, this is the consequence we would expect. When you cause it with my function, it actually generates these probability oscillations. So you can generate and see how these ended up. Like if we walk into a, a room and it's a mess, we wonder how did this become a mess? Well, you can go into the room and you can make a mess and say, yeah, that's how it has happened. <laughs> I had my kids in there, that's how. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> so you, you can you can, you can wait, determine wait, how these processes form. <laughs> yeah. I went through 600 iterations on that experiment to show that hey, this condition is only met when when that angle is at such and such value, and uh, um, when you get that over time, then you say yeah, it's always going to have to be at this value, and so um, there, there's something fundamental about that. And, Jeff, oh, I'm just itching to butt in if that's okay. Yeah, one, one more quick thing. Uh, very good. Your point is very well uh, taken because the thing is, like you say, when we go in the laboratory, and I'm an experimental physicist, but I also uh, done a lot of theory uh, with my, my research. And when we make, make measurements, it is an uncertainty based on the instruments, and there's nothing we can do about that. We are, we are not perfect. We are, we, are, we, are, we are just physical beings. And Jeff, I want your opinion on something. Um, I, if you take a look at my website, and uh, you know, you know, my website is on the NPA. I'm listed yeah, extinctionship.com. It's significant finding. Look at the the the, the <laughs> section on the uh, dual slit paradox, right? Okay. And when you have a dual slit, for an example, and you go on my website, scroll down, click on the chalkboard, right? And you see where I said on the chalkboard, extinctionship.com. I want your opinion on this. We don't know what a photon looks like. Nobody, nobody's ever seen a photon, all right? And some people uh, disagree with the idea of photons, whether photons exist, but I call them wave packets, you know? And you, it's an electromagnetic wave, whether you're talking about optics, whether you're talking about infrared, microwave, you know, gamma rays, all of these are electromagnetic waves, and, the, and, and, and we can't reinvent the wheel. Now, when you have a slit, two razor blades coming together, very close together with two edges, very sharp edges, that forms a slit. And a slit has two sharp uh, re-emitting edges. And those edges, you can, you, can have a, you can have an edge 
you can have a point or you can have a surface you know a point is just has no dimension but an edge is uh, it's just you know I say just right I took it has length and that, that's all and a very sharp edge is going to re remit a cylindrical wave where a point re emits a spherical wave and a surface is going to re emit a planar wave that is if you have a, a, a source that is infinite distance away if you have a wavelength that has a, a, a photon or wave that has a wavelength lambda associated with it and you have a razor blade for example now you can shoot a photon or wave packet through the slit if the slit is wide enough and there would be no interference now if I turn turn around and make the wave to make the slit comes closer together I bring the wave of the, the two razor blades close together it will go right through it right and I keep making making them narrower and narrower how close do I make those blades come before I get scattering and I get a, an image formed on the on the screen where you have interference patterns. Okay? Give, give me your thoughts on that. Oh, that's <clears throat> basically how small is the proton is I think what you're getting at, right? Uh, or not proton, but photon. So you're determining, you want to determine how, how much before it starts to get there. I would have, I have no idea. I never um, looked at the photon as so, as a terms of size, uh, whether it would be the radius of a photon. I would look at the Larmor radius of the wave and study that, and I would then make a prediction based on that. Um, but, yeah, I wouldn't know. It depends on the frequency and the wavelength of, of what you're looking at. I don't believe all photons, if they are a particle, I don't believe that they're all the same size anyway. I believe that that has, it's a, it's more of a, um, a standing wave or a node in the oscillation of a light ray. But I, I can't really say exactly what the size would be or how close you would have to get those slits. You know how how wide you'd have to make that slit. I have no idea. So, um, do I think it would? Do I think it would have an effect? Actually, I do. I believe it, it would. I believe that there is some some point if you get it really close you're going to start having a different results than the dual slit experiment you know, I think. I yeah there is, yeah yes yeah, yeah, there is a limit right yeah uh, I have and, you know, yeah, you get yeah. it you take a look at and i'd be happy to, to get your feedback on that thank you okay. thank you very much uh, thank you okay well we're getting close to we're 20 minutes over we probably need to wrap it up although uh I would like to make a short comment that, you know, essentially what I think your your concept of understanding uncertainty is very closely related to what we call chaos theory, which is uh, one way to think of it is to imagine a grain of sand and you're, you're dropping grains of sand into a pile and, you know, it could go one way or the other. Once it's, you know, and, and, the, and the, the amount of information, you know, the, 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 it, could, it could easily just, you know, with very little change, go a completely different direction. But once it's committed to a certain direction, it's going to go that way. That's the way uh, state theory works and the way quantum theory works, and that's the basis for un uncertainty, and it's, 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 the, it's the understanding of how, what we call chaos theory. So all those things are very much related. And um, anyway, if you want to make a yeah, comment on that. I, I don't think that my, my understanding of it is off um, course with, you know, it's not ra really radical. What's different is uh, showing how those conditions are, are met and what, you know, how to get, create, generate the condition so that you can analyze it and then you can go and look at those different components. I think it, it's a matter of going from away from statistic analysis. Instead of studying it from here we have this many particles, there's one here, one here, one here. We're going to um, calculate the, the probability distribution. This way would more generate the distribution and then analyze the results. That's kind of the difference. It's a different way of going about it. Excellent. But, yeah, and I, if I, I could, don't think, yeah, I'm not opposed to, you know. No, I understand. Is. I just, that's what, that's what occurs to me. The other thing that I just um, would like to share with you, I'd like to just, if I could write a quick little equation. Um, basically, you made the, the argument that uh, when, how do we say it? When the, the field and the change in the field are at 90 degrees, that's that's the condition for um, 
we can't get whiteboards anymore. That's the condition for stability or for, for, for continuing to go. Is that, you put it in different words, but that's essentially how I looked at it. Um, yeah, let me go back to the slide. I'm going to show you exactly where we are. Okay. Well, I just wanted to give you uh, something that I think is very simple, but also very profound. Okay. And that is, and I can't write it out, but if you can write this out on your paper, uh, the derivative with respect to time, that is ddt of a quantity a vector dot a vector. Okay. Well, a vector dot itself is just a squared. In other words, we're saying if the magnitude of that vector remains unchanged, in other words, it's stable, then when we vector, when we multiply that out separately, we get that a dot da dt times 2 equals 0. You with me? So, uh, so in other words, if, did I, did I go too fast? A little bit, but that's okay. Okay, but it was very, the, the, the point is this, that if the value of the vector remains constant, that is, the, the, in other words, if it's, it's moving in a circle, okay, but it's moving in a circle with a value that remains constant, the, it, it, it's stable. It stays that way forever. And the condition is that A and DA, DT, that is the, the, the vector and the change in the vector are, are at 90 degrees. They're orthogonal to each other because their dot product is zero. When that happens, then we get stability. We get, a, we get the, that the value of A remains constant, the, the, the absolute value, not the direction, but the value remains constant. And that's what's going on in, in what you're talking about. And that's another way of just mathematically saying what, what I believe you were saying on this slide. Last thing I want to say, I hope that made sense. Yeah, <laughs> I wish I, I could understand. write it out. I okay. Yeah, no, I so how did you make these pictures? These are beautiful. Did you make them or did you get them from someplace? No, I made them. Um, oh, wow. What did you do to make those pictures that are on this slide? Uh, a very expensive program. <laughs> oh, I'd sure love to have that program. That is Autodesk, awesome. Autodesk Desk Inventor uh, Lite. It's the, so that, you know, obviously the professional one's like $4,000. This one's like $1,400. Wow. Desk Inventor? Autodesk. They make AutoCAD products. Okay. Autodesk Inventor. Boy, I would love to get that. Wow, that's beautiful. Yeah. And and they're ruthless too. Don't try to bootleg. They're it. ruthless, they're, huh? They, they are. I mean, they. In fact, they don't even give. How did you, you get it? Through. Where do you got that kind of money? <laughs> I won't ask. Okay. I don't have it, don't have it anymore. Oh, that is so that nice. Program. No, yeah. I needed it for work, and uh, um, in my okay. free time, I use it for my inventions. Cool. So, very nice. Um, Okay, that, well, we're definitely over point. time now, and uh, why don't why don't you take Jeff if you want to take just a minute or two to, to conclude, and then we have Dr. Bill Lucas next week. Um, then we'll close it out. Oh well, I I thank you. I don't have anything else. I just want to say okay. uh, thank you all for being here. Um, <coughs> I don't have time to read through the comments, but it, it's nice. It seems you guys got uh, nice things to say. I hope anyone that had any questions uh, raised them. I also like to suggest that you all go out and buy a um, uh, one of those uh, exercise gyro balls, and then understand why I got a new product coming out. Um, it's going to compete with it. It's better. It's self-starting. Yeah. So um, keep your eye out for that, and definitely get one of those gyro balls, and you'll understand when you're holding it. You'll see it doesn't want to move from its point in space. It's very odd and very amazing. So and they're you can get them for 20 bucks if you get them Chinese version. So check it out. Thank you all. And uh, um, if you have any other questions, feel free to email me. Awesome. Uh, thank, thank you, me. Jeff. And I have one last announcement. Uh, I, I mentioned some stuff about the NPA, and I won't, I won't repeat that. But what I would like to say is there was, I, I don't know if everybody caught this. Maybe a lot of you haven't seen it yet. But uh, yesterday, there was an official announcement that Stephen Hawking has officially declared that he doesn't believe black holes exist. <laughs> Stephen Whoa. Hawking. Stephen Hawking. Yes. Whoa. Look it up. This is big news, yeah. guys. Yeah, this, is, uh, this is. People are going to say, well, you know, basically he just leveled the playing field and saying well, he's got a different theory, and then it went off on his new theory. But, uh, but essentially, Stephen Hawking. I mean, he's Mr. Black Hole. Is now yeah. saying there's no such thing as a black hole, guys. This means that th there's going to be some attention focused on on us. Seriously. So uh, this is big news and something to think about, something to write about, something to chat about. Um, he, find he, out about it.
if he's what he wrote is making sense, I'd like to see it. Well, the, I, as I see it, he's leveling the playing field. You know, now yeah. his theory is yeah. no better than anybody else's. You know, yeah. because we're, he's right. saying we're going to chuck black holes. Well, what are we going to replace it with? Well, here's my theory. Well, guess what? Here's uh, here's a few other theories that you know. What makes your theory any better than anybody else? The, pl the playing field has now been leveled, and I believe that those of us in the NPA stand to benefit from that. So, uh, no, so I agree. this is great. So, okay, I'll leave it. That's a very positive note. We'll leave it on that and stop the recording. See you all next week to see Dr. Lucas. Thank you. All right, thank you.